we will get going. Um, I'm going to give just a, a brief 10 minute or so introduction you know, here, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Stein in Zurich, Switzerland, who will be you know, leading our seminar today. Uh, about two or three times we'll take a break, come back to Asheville, then I'll lead questions for email and from the various sites then. Welcome from the University of North Carolina, Asheville, which is where we are broadcasting from today. It's a beautiful, somewhat warm day. Turns out that it's graduation weekend here. So all the 20 to 30 people in this room had to fight parking and then various uh, chairs lined up on front lawn to get here today. But I appreciate everybody coming. My name is Stephen Buser. I'm a psychiatrist here in the Asheville area. I've been in private practice a number of years. I've done some training at the Chicago Young Institute where I met Dr. Murray Stein, and we kicked off this whole project known as the Asheville Young Center. There's uh, a broad participation today, which we're most excited about. Our biggest focus is trying to connect you know, worldwide Jungian you know, peoples and organizations from around the world you know, to each other. Today we have 15 countries participating, which I would like to highlight. Those countries, of course, include the United States, but also Canada, Mexico, the United Kingdom, Belgium, France, Norway, Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, Ireland, Israel, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. So yet again, we're very, very pleased to have such a broad uh, connection of people you know, coming today. Some of them will be particip participating by email. Others will have live connections and we'll be checking in with them. I would like to take just a few moments to talk about the Asheville Young Center and what our vision and our goals are. Again, our main idea is to connect you know, people and ideas you know, from across the, the world. We do this through four you know, main uh, ways. We have live seminars, we have recorded seminars, we have some social media and a weekly blog which we've begun. The live seminars are of course what we're doing today. So we're plugged in for a live seminar with Murray Stein out of Zurich. And we hope to continue to do these every one to three months you know, or so. We have those same seminars recorded and if you go to our website you can browse through the 12 or so now recorded DVDs that we have and those are available for, for purchase on the website. We've begun some social media, which is Twitter, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, blogging. I'm not sure how many Jungians are really into that aspect of it, but it does seem to be a, a new way to connect you know, with folks. So if you have any interest in being a part of our communities there, again, the website can connect you to the, the LinkedIn and the various social media. Do check out our blog if you can. We call it a weekly blog. It's really not weekly. Sometimes it's two or three times a week. Sometimes it's every other week. But we are trying to have a regular kind of Jungian-oriented article that we put out. You know, Dr. Stein has written some of them, as has Dr. Cruz and myself, and we try to have those uh, disseminated you know, to people that have signed up for the, the blog. We also invite comments. We've gotten many, many comments so far on our blogs, and that's the interactive forum we're hoping for. So please do you know, look at the blog and ask possible you know, comment. That's what we're, we're all about. So I'd like to give a few thank yous today. Uh, most of all, the University of North Carolina, Asheville, which is where we are right now, at least where I am. And they are the technological hosts for today, and we are very indebted to them. That includes the University of North Carolina, Asheville Psychology Department, their Distance Learning Center, and what's called the NC Wren, which is a technological hub out of the Research Triangle Park in Raleigh, North Carolina. And they broadcast you know, this seminar you know, worldwide, and so we really appreciate uh, their help. We want to thank the Philemon Foundation. Many of you know about the Philemon Foundation. They are the ones that have as their mission to uh, bring forth in Carl Jung's work uh, in its entirety as much as possible. They were instrumental in the collected works, which are voluminous, but were very instrumental in the Red Book as well. So we want to highlight their uh, participation in bringing the Red Book available you know, to us today. There are a number of other organizations that are taking part, and I'd like to briefly read off you know, their names. That includes the Analytical Psychology Society of Western New York, Jung Cleveland, Jung Center of Houston, Centro Mexicano de C.G. Jung, San Antonio Jung Center, Santa Fe Center for Alchemical Studies, and the C.G. Jung Society of Seattle. And hopefully I remembered everybody there today. A few housekeeping pieces before we turn it over to Zurich. 
One is please do remember that we are recording all these seminars, so your image and or your voice you know, would be recorded if you choose to ask a question today. If that bothers you for some reason and you'd rather not you know, have your voice on our DVD to come, please either email or write out your question, hand it to the host of your site, and they can you know, read the question for you. But if you don't mind asking directly and you're in a site that allows you to do so, uh, then, then please you know, use the cameras. If you are in one of the sites that are not fully interactive, then you should have an email set up and you can email us questions. The host should have the email address you know, for you, but I'll say it again anyway. It's seminar at AshevilleYoungCenter.org. So seminar at AshevilleYoungCenter, all one word, dot O-R-G. And I'll be monitoring those emails here as they come in, and then I'll be asking those to Dr. Stein. So anybody in the internet land that would like to ask a question, please email it there. Uh, please turn off cell phones. Obviously, if you have a cell phone that's not on vibration, please change that over right now, because those will be picked up by the, the microphones. This is a three-hour seminar. We will have one break. and. If you do need to leave discreetly to either answer the phone or use the facilities uh, or need have food needs, please do so quietly. Uh, but that's certainly okay from our perspective. And lastly, please do give us feedback, things that work well for you today, things that don't work well for you today. Email at any of our email addresses, and I'll be reviewing those uh, comments and questions as well. So yet again, we are very pleased to uh, welcome Dr. Murray Stein you know, to our seminar uh, today. He has been really our anchor presenter for the two years that we've been doing this. We've had a few seminars from other presenters. He, by and far, is our anchor. Uh, that is because he is such a good presenter. You'll see today he is just very good at breaking down very complex terms and ideas into you know, common, understandable you know, themes. And the Red Book is about as complex as it gets, so I think we're very fortunate to have him you know, today. He is the president of the International ISAP, International School of Analytical Psychology, Zurich, which is one of the, the main institutes out in Zurich. There's a number there, but ISAP is the more internationally oriented of the, the schools. He's been prior you know, president of the analytical uh, psychology you know, international group and he has published numerous books and numerous articles. So without further ado, uh, I introduce to you Dr. Murray Stein. Thank you Steve. <clears throat> can you hear me alright? Coming across? Okay. Yes, we hear you well. Good. So it's a great pleasure to uh, present the second seminar on uh, the Red Book Liber Novus, C.G. Jung. Uh, in our lifetimes, it's been a privilege to have this book published. Uh, last fall, it's been nearly a hundred years since uh, Jung actually uh, began working on it and uh, spent about 14 or 16 years of his uh, active life, his midlife period basically, uh, composing uh, the Red Book and all of its, as Steve said, complexity and beauty. And as you see, uh, if you have the book, if you've seen the book, the calligraphy, the paintings, um, this is a facsimile edition of the actual Red Book. And uh, it's really very, very beautifully done uh, in a manner that uh, is both a scholarly contribution to the field and I think a real work of art and uh, is um, respectful of the quality and effort that Jung, I'm having trouble balancing it here, it's alive, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, respectful of the work and effort that Jung put into it. Uh, for Jung it certainly was an extremely uh, valuable um, piece of work that he gave his very life's blood to over a number of years. I'd like to put it in context before we begin, in the context of Jung's life. And I've drawn a couple of uh, um, uh, lines on the graph sheet here. The first is uh, Jung's lifespan line. Jung was born in yeah. eight, 1875 and died in 1961. So he was 86 years old. Uh, at the time of his death. 
And what we're focusing on in looking at the red book is really his midlife period. Um, the black book entries, uh, when Jung had the experiences that, uh, that he later uh, in, inscribed in calligraphy, in calligraphic form, in the red book, he first um, wrote them down in what he called the black books. And the black book is a book that looks like this. This is a black book, the small book. And uh, in these books, Jung would uh, write down, record his uh, experiences as they took place over a period of years. And uh, then he took the material from these black books and he made a, uh, a manuscript from them. He edited the manuscript, he added to the manuscript, uh, and from that uh, then uh, modified and edited and uh, enlarged manuscript, he created uh, what he called the Liber Novus, or the, or the Red Book. And the entries uh, into the Black Book took place between uh, basically November 1913 and June 1st, 1916. So it's a period of about roughly three years uh, where uh, he was having the, um, uh, what we call active imaginations, the visions, the experiences that are recorded in the Red Book. Um, he worked on it uh, basically until 1930. And it, you could say it was stimulated uh, even before he began the entries in the Black Book uh, I date it to 1912, where he had an important dream that he records in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, where he uh, saw a bird enter into the room. The bird turned into a little girl, oh girl, and he identified that as his soul. And the little girl says to him in the dream, uh, I can only be uh, with you for one hour of the day because the rest of the time I have to spend with the, with the dead. And um, then she disappears. And of course, Jung wonders about that. Who are the dead? Why does she have to, what does this mean? Uh, that turns out to be a very important theme in the material in the Red Book. Uh, taking care of the dead, who are the dead? What do they want? And we'll see today as we look at uh, a portion of the, of the text in the Red Book, I'm going to focus on the third part uh, where the, um, the return of the dead plays such an important role and how important it, is, it was for Jung to put them to rest and let them go on their journey. Um, another important instigator, I would say, of, of uh, the Red Book uh, was a dream that Jung had in uh, 1909 when he went to the United States with Freud. They went to Clark University for a centenary celebration of that university and they were both given honorary doctorate degrees at the time, and uh, Freud introduced psychoanalysis, some of his ideas, to the American audience, and Jung lectured on word association experiment and uh, child analysis. And um, on the way back uh, from that uh, 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 event in uh, Clark University of Worcester, Massachusetts, on ship, on board ship, Jung had a dream um, in which he's in a house and he goes down a series of stairs into a basement and a sub-basement and a still lower basement, down, 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 until he comes at the very bottom to a very archaic uh, room, a kind of archaeological space where he discovers the bones of ancestors and so on. And uh, he and Freud were sharing their dreams and exchanging them. When he told Freud this dream, Freud interpreted it in such a way that Jung uh, uh, found quite lacking. Uh, and he tucked away in the back of his mind, I've got to really understand this dream in my own way. Freud saw it as an indication of a death wish on his part toward Freud. Might have been the case, uh, but uh, Jung couldn't connect to that and he didn't uh, find it very useful to think about it that way. When it comes to the time of the Red Book and the experience of uh, going into the unconscious, that dream functioned as a kind of uh, guiding uh, uh, image as he goes down and down through the layers of the unconscious and experiences all kinds of things and dynamics and processes, energies, figures, images come to him, conversations develop. That's his, he's descending it through the layers of the unconscious until he touches bottom 
and as we'll see, it comes back up to the surface um, and uh, with uh, a very important message for himself and perhaps some, some uh, hints and messages for us as well. And I will try to uh, elaborate on that uh, toward the end of the seminar today. I'm going to divide this into three parts and leave time for your questions because I'm sure you have many of them by now. Uh, the first part will be to um, uh, see where the, um, the second part of the Red Book, the so-called uh, Liber Secundus, ends, and then we'll begin the third part of the book called Scrutinies, um, and I'll get us a ways into that in the first part of the seminar, and then the second part of the seminar will focus on the heart of the Scrutinies, which is the seven sermons to the dead and the teachings of Philemon. Um, and then in the third part of the seminar, I will take a look at uh, the conclusion of the scrutiny is really the conclusion of this whole project, uh, how it ends um, and what, what it might mean for, uh, what it, certainly what it meant for Jung individually, we'll consider that, but what it might mean uh, for the field of analytical psychology today now that this book has come into, uh, into the public view uh, and we can study it, what it might mean to analysts, psychotherapists, and what it might mean to our times. I would like to consider uh, the question, does this book have a meaning for our times for the 21st century and going forward? Jung called it the Liber Novus, the new book. So uh, he saw it as a message for the future. He's not, uh, the figures he deals with and contacts are certainly historic figures, Elijah, Salome, uh, Philemon, and so on, have a uh, Christ, appears a couple of times in there, uh, certainly have a deep historical significance and resonance, but uh, what he's trying to do is to bring Western consciousness up to date and indicate a way for it to go forward into the future uh, while not cutting itself off from the past. I think that's his fundamental project to link past, present, and future and to try to find a way for modern men and women to touch upon the what has really been lost in modernity to so many people. Jung spoke of modern man in search of his soul, uh, really to touch upon the element of soul, not just as our subjectivity, but as something, some point of contact with transcendence in ourselves, some point of contact with eternity and immortality and where do we go after, after we pass through this world? Uh, that's a question that he raises with great force and Philemon addresses in the sermons. So that's what we'll consider in the third part. So to get us into this material, let me just um, review a little bit uh, uh, some of the things that we said last time and bring us up to speed on, on uh, getting uh, where we are in the Red Book toward the end of uh, Liber Secundus and moving forward into scrutinies. Um, if we look at the entries in the Black Books, just to give us an orientation of uh, how intensively Jung worked and the, the kind of uh, graph of, of uh, intensity that rises and falls away in both of these, uh, the Red Book and the scrutinies, I've made a record of the dates in which he makes entries into the Black Book, Black Books. And they begin on November 12, 1913, with his first entry into, the, um, into what later he called the uh, uh, Liber Primus, the first book. The, the Red Book itself is divided into two parts, Liber Primus, Liber, Liber Secundus. Um, and he begins on November 12th. And uh, you can see on 12th, 14th, 15th, 28th, it gets going. It's pretty strong. There's a strong movement. And what he's doing now is finding a way to get down. He's trying to find an entry point into the unconscious or into the darkness. He doesn't use any psychological language in the Red Book. Never uses, I think he uses the word unconscious one time. I no noticed in a note by the editor, uh, Sonar Sham Dasani. Uh, he uses no technical language. This is the language of, uh, of, the, of any literate person. Anybody can, can read this and understand it. You don't have to have technical knowledge of psychology or psychoanalysis. 
but he's trying to get down and he finally finds a way in through a cave and he, he, there, he opens a rock, a rock peels away and he looks down deeper and he sees a stream of water flowing and all of that takes place here. He's getting down into the unconscious and then it really gets going and you can see all the entries in December, very active in December. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, over the Christmas holidays. He's probably not working, he's staying at home, uh, taking a couple of weeks off from his practice and so on. And he really intensively now goes into his uh, confrontation, as he calls it in his uh, autobiography, confrontation with the unconscious. And it's in this period of time that Elijah and Salome appear, uh, De Rota, the Red One, um, Isdubar, um, and the other characters, Soul, and, and so on and so forth, in December and January. January and December are the heart of this, and lots of entries also in January. And it's in this period where he really penetrates to the bottom of what he feels is his uh, sanity. He actually touches on a wall, and he, f he feels that if he breaks through that wall, it's like a, like a skin or a membrane, if he breaks through it and the flood of chaos enters into his psyche, he'll be drowned. So he comes right up to the edge. And uh, in a certain moment uh, in his active imagination, he's even hospitalized. He's given a diagnosis by a fat little psychiatrist to a very rational man who sees him as having really gone over the edge. Uh, but he, of course, pulls himself back and it's a, a dream and he finds himself uh, back in a dialogue and conversation with various figures and intensively January, February, and then it more or less starts tapering off in February, March is silent, and then the last entry on April 19th. Now, just before this began, again to give it a bit of context, uh, on uh, the 27th of October, 1913, Jung resigned from his editorship uh, of the Jahrbuch. Uh, the Jahrbuch was a journal founded by himself and Freud, and he had been the editor since its founding in, I think, 1908 or so. He breaks with Freud uh, earlier, 1912, 1913, the beginning of 1913, no more letters between them, no more personal exchanges. Uh, He's still the president of the IPA, the International Psychoanalytic Association, but he resigns from the Jahrbuch. He then has all of these active imaginations finishing on April 19th, and I'll give some of the contents of this period down here just in a moment. On April 20th, he resigns his position as president of the International Psychoanalytic Association. And 10 days later, he resigns his position at the University of Zurich in the, in the medical school. And so at that point, he really has freed himself from external obligations, uh, what he calls the spirit of the times, and uh, he's on his own. And uh, he concludes uh, down here, as I will tell you in a moment, uh, with a sentence that the test, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, um, what he calls the uh, Prüfstein, and I wanted to find that term in a moment, the lodestone or the testing stone uh, of his work is that he's able to go it alone. Uh, der Weg des Einzelnen, the way of the solitary one, the way of the individual. And he's had to go through this whole process in order to get up the courage and to find a standpoint in himself so that he can really go his own way apart from uh, university psychiatry, apart from psychoanalysis, and so on. So on April 20th, he resigns from the university, from the IPA, 10 days later from the university. On the same day, April 19th, he begins what uh, is called in the translation scrutinies, Prüfungen in German, Prüfungen. And that then begins the third part, which is what we're going to focus on mostly today. And that starts in 1914 on April 19th, the day that he finishes with uh, Liber Secundus. There are some entries in May. Um, and then there's quite a long break, about a year. Silence. No more messages from the depths. 
die Stimmen der Tiefen sind still. The, the, the voices of the deep are quiet. Nothing happens for about a year. Then during the summer, there's an experience that I'll tell you about. And then in the fall, late fall, it starts again in December. And then it builds up intensity in 1916. And in this period, between uh, around Christmas 1915 until June 1st, 1916, there's again, again a tremendous amount of activity. And in this heart of this period is uh, the uh, Philemon expounds the seven sermons to the dead, which is really well, pretty much the heart of this uh, third part of the Red Book. Uh, so that is the outline, and you can see this, this building of intensity, lots of entries, lots of work going on, then it falls off, then there's a period of quiet, and then it gets going again. So it comes in two waves. The first wave is the Libra Primus, Libra Secundus, and the second wave is scrutinies. Now, let me return to uh, what we touched on last time when we finished, and that is the ending of Liber Secundus. Where does that leave Jung? Um, because it is, it is an ending of sorts. The Red Book, as I explained last time, is layered. Uh, there are the experiences themselves. There is the recording of them in the Black Books. There's the making of a transcript. Then he buys a, a leather-bound book about this size, and he starts the calligraphy, and he writes that in, and then he paints pictures to illustrate some of the figures. Other pictures come from dreams, and the whole thing takes him until about 1930 to complete the Red Book. But in the Red Book itself, he doesn't actually uh, uh, finish the work. It stops in mid-sentence. Um, uh, at a certain point, he either loses interest or it's just too time consuming or he, uh, he's, what he says is that he became interested at that point in the outer world. He was ready to go out and take his, uh, put his energies to work in the world and not spend so much time in introspection and uh, inner work. He felt he had more or less finished the work uh, needed to that point and then in 1928 through the 30s, uh, he was very busy in the world, very active, uh, trying to guide and steer the uh, psychotherapy movement in Europe through the difficulties of the 30s until the war period. The war started in 1939, 1940. And then after that, you have the late period, Jung's late period when he is uh, writing some of his greatest works. Uh, but in coming into old age, his health isn't very good, he doesn't really have an active practice anymore, and he spends all of his time then writing the great books that we know today as Ion, Answer to Job, Mysterium Conjunctionis, and so forth, that last very active period from 1945 to his death in 1961. But toward, as he comes toward the end of the Liber Secundus, now going back, uh, just backing up here, to into this period, um, what he uh, uh, what he writes about there is um, a, a kind of uh, initiation, a kind of test and trial that he has to go through. He goes through a number of trials, or you could say, initiation procedures uh, in these active imaginations. Uh, there's an early one when uh, he is. He finds himself extended in the form of a crucified Christ and his body uh, changes form and a serpent winds around him and he uh, uh, is able to heal the blindness of Salome. That, that's a, an initiation of sorts into a, a mystery of shamanism and healing and identification with uh, a savior figure. He then steps back from that and over and over again you see him coming into close contact with these figures and stepping away from them, not identifying with them, having the experiences, stepping back and reflecting on him. And more and more as, as the work goes on, the importance uh, uh, that he places on separation, on not identifying with the figures, on putting them into another realm, 
letting them exist elsewhere with his ego consciousness existing on this side, in this time zone. They are of another realm. Uh, that process of a, a disidentification and separation becomes very critical as the work goes on. At first he's quite identified with it. Uh, a second similar type of initiation takes place toward the end of Liber Secundus. He's hung in a tree. For three days and three nights he's hanging in a tree. And uh, this is a test to see if he's willing to split uh, heaven and earth above and below, uh, the spiritual and the instinctual. And he refuses either to go up or down. Uh, he's tempted in both directions. And so, like Odin hanging from the tree of uh, the, the world tree for three days, sacrificing his eye for the sake of wisdom, sort of Nordic mythology in the background of this, Jung hangs from this tree, uh, suffering for three days, and then is refusing to separate above and below, saying that he isn't willing to split the opposites. He's going to endure the test and the trial of holding the opposites together, holding the tension. Finally, he's released after three days. He drifts to the ground, greatly relieved finally to be out of that fix. Uh, and then he uh, is presented with a fairy tale. A serpent who has become a very important symbol was there already in one of his first uh, active imagination experiences with Elijah and Salome. There was a serpent lurking about. Ser the serpent rep represents for him uh, the lower instinctual realms. He also looks upon them as the location of divinities. There are deities and divinities above. The bird flies up above the spiritual realm. But there are also deities and divinities below in the earth, uh, earth deities. And uh, the serpent is in connection with those. And the serpent brings him uh, um, a great deal of uh, uh, teaching and wisdom, introduces him to all kinds of um, uh, things that he, that he needs and didn't know about. And one of them is a fairy tale that the serpent tells him. Uh, as far as I know, it, it may be an original fairy tale. I haven't, uh, I, to my knowledge, it doesn't appear in the world's fairy tales anywhere, but I may be wrong. I'm not an expert on the world's fairy tales. If some of you know another source, please uh, let me know. I'd be very interested to know that. The fairy tale is that there is a king who, uh, between him and his wife, the queen, can't produce an heir, a son. Um, and so in this dilemma, uh, he goes into the woods and uh, asks an old woman, a wise old woman in the woods, what he might do in order to um, produce an heir. And she tells him exactly what to do. She says, take such and such a materials, put it into a pot, bury the pot in the ground, cover it up, leave it there for nine months. After nine months, come and dig it up and see what's in the pot. So he does that. And lo and behold, when he comes back there after nine months and digs up the pot, opens it up, there's a little baby boy, perfectly formed, beautiful child, takes it home, gives it to his wife, and she starts nursing it and feeding it. Uh, and the child uh, grows beautifully. Um, healthy, intelligent, beautiful, uh, just the perfect um, heir for this king. But a problem uh, does present itself when upon reaching 18 years of maturity, the boy comes to his father and says that he's ready to take over the kingdom now. And he wants the king to turn it over to him. Uh, give, me, uh, give me the kingdom, I'll take good care of you, but it's my turn now. Uh, the king isn't ready to give up the kingdom yet, um, and so he's in a dilemma because the boy is very strong, the boy is very insistent, uh, but he doesn't uh, want to leave his position yet. So he goes to the woman in the woods and he says, um, you know, I've really got a problem with this boy, I need to get rid of him. Uh, he's causing me a lot of trouble, what can I do? And she tells him exactly what to do. Uh, take this material, bury it in the ground, and go home, and you'll see that your son uh, uh, changes. So he does that, and lo and behold, the son 
gets weak and gets sick and eventually dies. This solves the problem on one level, but uh, the king is very unhappy in time because he doesn't have an heir and he really misses the lad who was such a good boy, beautiful boy, intelligent, uh, handsome, uh, had everything that, a, that he could want in an heir. Uh, so he gets depressed and he goes to the woods again and he asks the old woman in the woods, what can I do uh, about this? And she says, well, tells him exactly what to do. Take this material, bury it in the ground, leave it for nine months, come back and see what's there. He does that. Um, comes back, nine months, opens it up and there's the baby boy again, alive and well. He brings it home. This time the boy grows up very rapidly and in a couple of years he's 18 years old and again he demands the kingdom. But this time the king is ready to give it up so he agrees and he turns it over to the boy and uh, the boy takes the crown, puts it on his head and says that he will take very good care of his father and mother, thank you very much and uh, he turns out to be a very fine king. And the father turns out to be able to accept it and uh, uh, be able to let go of the ring of power. So that's the message uh, of, the, of the fairy tale, that the king has to be ready to let go of the ring of power. Um, and the reason he gives this story to, to Jung is that he says, you too have to give up the authority and the power from your ego position to what you have given birth to in these previous uh, active imaginations. You've given birth to uh, something out of the under, underground, something irrational, um, we would call it the sense of self or the self. Uh, 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 you've, you, you have to submit, you have to give over the power to uh, this other um, center of, uh, of consciousness in yourself. And uh, shortly after that, uh, lo and behold, uh, the sun appears to Jung, he comes up out of the ground, out of a swamp, uh, a frog is associated um, and appears to Jung and they have a dialogue and a conversation. And he's a kind of, uh, you could say, uh, lordly figure uh, and Jung uh, recognizes his authority, is willing to give over his authority to him. Uh, and then the sun ascends into the heavens and disappears into the heavens. Um, so there's a, a, an ascension. Yesterday we had a holiday here in Switzerland, I suppose you did in the United States too, it was Ascension Day, but here it's really a holiday. Everything closes down, there's nobody on the streets, it's like Sunday. All the stores are closed, the banks are closed, they call it Auffart, Auffart Tag, Ascension Day. And uh, it's a day that uh, uh, celebrates and recognizes the ascension of Christ to, uh, to heaven 40 days after Easter. And so there's a kind of ascension of this young man into the heavens and he becomes uh, a figure uh, that Jung identifies with one of the gods, the sun god or uh, the god of the heavens. Um, not the only god in Jung's cosmology as we'll see in a moment, but uh, a very important one. But at the end of Liber Secundus, Jung is left utterly alone. Uh, all the figures have disappeared there is a scene in which he covers up the entrance into the underworld. Uh, mountains are brought to cover it up. Waters are cover, cover it up. It's sealed off and uh, he's left uh, utterly by himself. And then he um, ends the work uh, with the sentence, the touchstone as being alone with oneself, this is the way. And the word that he uses, touchstone, in German is Priefstein, Priefstein. I went to a jeweler in my neighborhood and asked him, does he know what a Priefstein is? What is a touchstone? I looked it up in the dictionary, of course, as well, and uh, he gave me one. It's a small one, looks like this. It's a little black stone you can get them in various sizes, uh, but it's, it's composed uh, of a material, I don't know exactly what it is, but if you take a, a piece of gold, a coin or a ring or something, 
and you rub it across the surface of the stone and then you put a chemical on it, uh, the stone will tell you the quality of the gold. It assays the gold. If it's 14 carat, 18 carat, you'll get a different color. And so jewelers or assayists, assayers, uh, will use a Prüfstein, uh, or what we call in English a touchstone, to um, establish the, the value, uh, the quality, uh, the qualities of, of, the, of the metal that they're testing. Okay, that's a Prüfstein. And Jung says the Prüfstein, Prüfstein, the touchstone, is being alone with oneself. Uh, this is the way. And we know from the beginning that he's been seeking the way. How to be out in the world, uh, having let go of various uh, associations and relationships and, and uh, ideological and, and uh, professional ideas and commitments, having gone in this other direction. Now what? Now he's alone. He doesn't have any guides or advisors, inner figures, all alone, all by himself. But this is the test. And uh, he's going to be put to the test. Okay, Can you stand it to be alone? This is the way. Um, on the same day that he says that, he starts the section that he later calls Prüfungen. Now, this, these divisions are, are, are made by him later, Liber, Liber Primus, Liber Secundus, Prüfungen. Uh, in the black books are just uh, continuous entries, but when he gets around to editing it, putting it into order, elaborating, making commentaries, thinking about it, interpreting it, as he does in the red book, uh, he divides it into three sections. And now we come to the section called Prüfungen, or scrutinies in the English translation that was made for this book. Incidentally, this material has never been translated before. The translators, three of them, uh, worked on translating all of this material into English from German. Now, Prüfungen, uh, at first I was very unhappy with that translation, scrutinies, because it isn't a word that we use that much. I would have, uh, in English, I would have preferred uh, something like examinations or trials, tests, you know, every school child knows what a Prüfungen, what Prüfungen are, or what a Prüfung is. Uh, when you go to, and, and we often have these dreams in adulthood, that terrible dream that you're going to go into a test in mathematics or something, you haven't studied a day for it, and suddenly you're confronted with a test. You're going to be put to the test. That's a Prüfung. Uh, so children are very familiar with that word, Prüfungen. Um, but uh, I also saw in the newspaper the other day that the word prefung was used to uh, uh, describe what is being done with the, um, the bonds that various governments have, have sold uh, over the past couple of years, Greece and uh, Portugal and Spain in particular. And the rating services are taking a careful look at these bonds. Uh, they might have to downgrade the rating. And that's called prefung. They are going to test those bonds. They're going to scrutinize them. So the word scrutiny isn't a bad word. It's also used in the law when you say, does it bear scrutiny? Does this contract bear scrutiny? Um, does, it, does it hold water? Does it make sense? Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of testing, a careful looking, scrutinizing. And Jung is now going to scrutinize himself. He's alone and the scrutiny begins. So at the beginning of the scrutinies, the first part, that takes place right at the beginning on April 19th and 20th, Jung uh, engages in talking to himself. He, he splits himself into two parts. Uh, there's a part that's, uh, that represents the ego, kind of passive, uh, and then there's the part that's looking at the ego, uh, looking at himself. It's like he's looking at himself in the mirror. And he's giving himself a rating. Uh, you know, he's a rating service. Uh, he's standing back 
kind of as a psychiatric diagnostician, tough-minded, really looking at his character structure. And what he sees basically appalls him. Uh, he can barely stand to look at himself. Uh, it, it is extreme. When you read this, this passage in the Prefugen, uh, the, way he, um, the way he criticizes himself is beyond what most of us would, uh, would find tolerable. We, we tend to think it's much better to be nice to ourselves and to forgive ourselves and to be uh, defensive about ourselves. So we don't look in the mirror that way very often. And uh, Jung is really putting himself to the test uh, in a very, very harsh, almost abusive, but very tough way. And what he sees is basically a narcissistic character disorder, as we would call it today uh, in our lingo. He sees himself as um, oversensitive, ambitious, touchy, arrogant, uh, he uses the word ambitious quite office, often, ehrgeizig in German, ehrgeizig. That means you're hungry for honors. You want honor. You want to be recognized. And in order to be recognized, you will, um, you will cover the truth. You will make things look better than they really are. You'll oversell yourself. You'll, you'll claim to be able to know that you know things you don't really know. You, you're claiming value for yourself in public in order to get honor. And I think as Jung is looking back on himself and his behavior in the past uh, years, I don't know how far back he's looking, but say into the near past where he was very touchy and very sensitive about what Freud said about him. It's the reason he, he finally broke with Freud because Freud gave him a bad review uh, for his book, uh, Van Lung and uh, uh, Der Zim uh, Zimbola. Uh, he, uh, he was very upset that, that Freud uh, had said that this book wasn't really, didn't offer anything uh, particularly interesting or particularly new. He really got his feelings hurt. And it was out of that, you could say, narcissistic rage uh, at Freud for treating him that way, that he wrote some very nasty letters to Freud and it really uh, brought to a head their troubled relationship. I don't think it created it, but it brought it to a head and ended in, a, in the rupture uh, that was never worked through, was never really dealt with. They never saw each other again after the Congress in 1913. And, um, I think uh, when Jung looks at his behavior and what he did, he sees that he overreacted, he was touchy, and that his whole career in psychoanalysis had been driven not by really finding so much value in what these ideas were, but uh, they were getting him a lot of honor, a lot of recognition. He, was, he had an honorary doctorate at, at the age of about 30, 20, uh, 34, awfully young to be getting an honorary doctorate from Clark University, uh, world, of, uh, world famous, internationally famous, people coming to him for treatment from America. Uh, the McCormicks came from Chicago. He flew to Chicago, come and didn't fly in those days, took the ship a couple of times to Chicago to treat one of the McCormicks for alcoholism. And uh, uh, so he, um, he's looking at his behavior, he's looking in the mirror, and he really doesn't like what he sees. And he knows that now he has to live with himself. He can't divert it to push it off, uh, project it, give it to somebody else, criticize somebody else for it. He's looking at himself. And what he sees is not a pretty picture. Well, that's a, a very tough confrontation. And he asks himself the question, um, when he looks at himself, he says, are you educable? Can, can I really make anything out of you? beyond the medieval barbarian that you are. He sees himself as a medieval barbarian. Can I grow you up out of your narcissism? Uh, and he talks about cleansing the vessel. Is it possible? He wonders. Well, in the midst of that, uh, he resigns as president of the IPA and he resigns from his university. 
and then shortly thereafter uh, the rest of the Prefungen uh, starts and uh, that is uh, really now gets into the heart of it. The soul comes to him. Uh, since he covered it all up and was by himself and the God ascended, the Son ascended, to whom he gave over authority, he was alone. And now they start returning. And in the rest of the Prefungen, we see a, uh, a um, kind of uh, um, fewer characters, uh, much more consistent. It isn't so much a series uh, of different characters appearing anymore. There are two or three basic characters that appear in the scrutinies, and they uh, develop a relationship with Jung, and uh, they come back night after night. And the two main figures, uh, first one appears now in, in May, May 8th, is the soul, a figure called the soul. It's a feminine figure. And interspersed with, a, with the appearance of the soul is the figure of Philemon. And in scrutinies, uh, Philemon really becomes a guide, a teacher. And we'll want to look carefully at what Philemon represents and who he is uh, as we go on. So uh, uh, there's a kind of uh, reduction of the characters, you could say, a kind of simplification or, uh, and an intensification, a pointing, a, shar a point, uh, sharpening of the point. Uh, and uh, then the dialogues that come forward now in the rest of the scrutinies are with these, basically with these two characters, soul, the soul, and Philemon. And I'm going to, I think, stop here so that we have a time for questions. Um, and then we'll continue with the second part and move further into scrutinies. Well, thank you, Murray. Thank you so much. Excellent yeah, beginning. We're going to take some questions. I'll first open up to Asheville in a moment. Then we'll go to Mexico. And then I'll read uh, one or more email questions at that point. So first here in Asheville, there was a question earlier. You might have stepped out. It's not pertinent yet. Not pertinent yet. OK. Um, other questions. Go ahead. I'd like to um, you know if Dr. Stein could explain a little bit more to us about Jung's process of active imagination. Um, is this like putting yourself into a trance? Did he use the writing as the mechanism to engage in these in this process, or did he just um, sit quietly and have fantasies? H how, how do we understand that? Well, we don't really have a picture of uh, how how he did it. Um, when you read it, 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 it isn't quiet. It's, it's like there's a, a tremendous, he's tremendously stirred up. Um, and he's uh, engaged uh, uh, with the figures. Uh, as I imagine it, I, I've been to his house a number of times and I, I know what his study looks like and his library. I imagine him sitting there in the evening after a day's work um, and uh, uh, waiting, uh, waiting for something to happen, because what he says is, uh, sometimes, you know, a voice says to me, and I look and I see so-and-so, I see such a person. And then he describes that figure in great detail, the color of the clothes they're wearing, the surroundings. Uh, there's a lot of sensate detail in it, so, uh, but it's not really like a trance. Uh, it's not channeling. It, it, he doesn't. Uh, he's very much in his ego consciousness. He challenges the figures. He asks them questions, um, uh, and I think he is uh, uh, really. Uh, uh, he waits for them to arrive. We'll see a little later when the scrutiny starts up after this summer break, or in the summer uh, of 1915. He's out on the lake and he sees something and then he hears a voice. 
Uh, so it might come to him spontaneously like that, but mostly I think he's sitting in his study at the end of the day uh, with, a, with a black book in front of him and waiting for something to happen. And then he writes down the dialogue or the scene. Does that answer your question? Any other questions in Asheville? Any questions in the room here? I should say one other thing about that. In Memories, Dreams, Reflections, he describes uh, some scenes uh, in his in his garden. Uh, he said that during this period, he took up with uh, the, the the play of, of of his childhood. He would go out and he would uh, during the lunch hour. Typically, at that time, people took a two hour or so lunch. Uh, and his office was in his home. So he'd go out in the garden and he built little uh, castles and fortresses and, and uh, channeled water and, you know, the way children will play in the sand. And uh, he says this gave him, uh, a, a, this helped him to release the fantasies, he said. It helped him to release the fantasies. So it could well be that he was doing something like that when some of these fantasies came to him and not sitting at his desk. Uh, I think it varied, but I just wanted to add that bit. Um, I know that out at uh, his tower at Bollingen, he would uh, sit there and look at the stone in the, in the wall and see figures in the stone, as you do if you look at a, uh, you know, a, a rough, uh, like a marble floor or a stone wall, you, you know, you stare at or look at clouds. Sometimes you see figures, and then as he saw these figures, he would chisel away the bits around it so that it created a relief, a bas-relief uh, image of the figures. If you go out to bowling and if you ever have the chance, you'll see some of these carved on the, on the walls of the building. And, uh, or he, he carved in stone. Uh, there are various, uh, he also whittled uh, wood. Uh, so he, I think it helped him to use his hands and to, uh, do something physical. Um, there is a, a, well, maybe I'll save that, but there's a passage in the scrutinies where the soul tells him to take the thoughts that she gives him and make them into something physical, that it gives them more force, it gives the thoughts more force if they're put into material form. And I think that's why he, he made the Red Book and took so much time with calligraphy and painting, why he built bowling and the tower and uh, did his stone carvings and so on. You're, he's putting into a material form the thoughts that have come to him, not just out of his own thinking process, but from the soul. These come from, from another place, from, we'd say from the anima or the unconscious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Actually, we do have one more question here before we go to Mexico. Carl, go ahead. Is there any evidence from the scrutinies that that Jung was having a, um, a psychotic break? Um, there, when I read uh, the Red Book, not only the scrutinies, but uh, the whole thing, uh, Liber Primus and Secundus as well, I don't see anything like a psychotic break. I think uh, for a long time, people thought he was, uh, he, he, was having a breakdown or something terrible happened to him during this midlife period. Um, Ellen Berger, when he wrote the book the, on the history of the unconscious, uh, called it a, uh, a um, what, what was it, a creative illness. Um, it was an, a very intense inner experience, but, but the ego is always in control. Um, there's no sign that, that uh, the ego is confused uh, with identifying the figures. The ego loses itself. The figures take, take over or take control. In a psychotic break, usually, you, you know, you've lost control of your mind. It's very scary. I think he was afraid of it um, going into this material, but it never happened. Uh, and there are places in there where he dismisses the figures. He says, I've had enough now. Go away. And he just stops it. Uh, so, and throughout this period, he's also uh, functioning. Um, he does 
uh, even though he resigned these positions, he maintained his practice at home. He has a family. I asked his son one time, uh, his son was a, I think his son was born around 1910. So he would have been a child of four or five years old at this time until 1930 when he was 20 or so. And he said, oh, in that period, uh, it was normal family life. We would go sailing on the lake. We went for picnics. We went camping. Jung loved to go camping on the, uh, on the upper lake of Zurich. Didn't notice anything amiss. So uh, Jung had two worlds. He lived in, a, in the day world, the spirit of the times, where he functioned. He also traveled and gave lectures. Uh, not during the war. He couldn't. He was isolated in Switzerland. But he was served in the army. Uh, he was an army doctor. Uh, he was the commandant of the Chateau uh, de um, um, camp for uh, not prisoners of war, but uh, uh, soldiers who had drifted into Switzerland and were being kept by an, out of the war by a neutral power, and they were housed in a barracks uh, that the Swiss army maintained, and Jung was the commandant of that. He ran it. So he was perfectly functional. Um, and. Um, uh, I don't think he, there were no psychotropic drugs at that time. He just maintained his own balance as best he could. During the height of these experiences, when they were really coming fast and furious, I imagine he uh, was very engaged by his thoughts. You know, if you, if you become obsessed with your thoughts, and for a couple of days, especially creative people, they'll disappear. You don't, you can't talk to them. They're off thinking their thoughts somewhere and uh, you know, novelists, musicians, they're notorious for this kind of thing. Uh, Mahler would, would go spend his summers in the mountains of Austria. His family had to live in one house and he lived in another because he didn't want to be disturbed while he was writing his symphonies. And if anybody came and bothered him or made noise or a dog barked, he had a fit uh, because he just got lost in his music. And it was something like that. Jung just got lost in this material and uh, not really lost because he, he maintained his footing, but he was very absorbed in it for certain uh, intense periods of time. But psychotic, no, I don't see any evidence of it whatsoever. Yeah, I might add something to that as well as a practicing psychiatrist. Um, here, I had a young man in my office just this week with a psychotic you know, break, and I really would distinguish those two you know, markedly, particularly as Dr. Stein was saying, in the level of functioning, if somebody you know, really have schizophrenia or a psychosis, they're going to not function in, in other areas of life pretty dramatically. When we look at Jung, at least my understanding of it, you, there was some pretty prime intense material in the Red Book, but there really wasn't evidence of psychosis and you know, paranoia and whatnot through in other areas of his life. So it seemed like he had it, you know, someone contained. Let me go to Mexico then if there's time, we'll come back to questions here. Uh, Mexico, ¿cuántas personas tienen ustedes allá y tiene algunas preguntas por uh, nosotros ahora? <laughs> We're 12 people and yes, there are a couple of questions. Hmm? One right. question is, why does the Red Book have this tripartite structure? Does this say anything to us? That's the question of one of the participants here in Mexico. I can't really answer that with any uh, certainty. Uh, maybe Sonu Shamdasani, who has worked with this material for years and years and had access to the black books and the, all the, the transcripts that were created from the black books, could, could say. But it is, uh, it is an artificial construction uh, to divide uh, the books that way. The first and the second, Liber Primus and Liber Secundus, are divided at the point where Jung stopped writing the calligraphy on parchment because he discovered that the paint peeled off of the parchment. And so he went and bought the, the leather bound book and he started writing in on the pages of the book and painting on the pages of the book. It's a, and then he took the parchment pages and inserted them into the book and that's Liber Primus, the first uh, book. And Liber Secundus starts with the ri actual writing in the, in the re red book itself. Scrutinies is separated out. Again, I don't know why he uh, decided to create a separate manuscript of the prefung, and that doesn't, he doesn't really start working on that until, um, oh, 19, 19, the winter of 1917, he starts writing uh, the manuscript that would become the prefung. 
Um, but what this means, I mean, he gives them names, the first book, the second book, and the scrutinies. Um, I don't know what he had, uh, what his intention was. That, that would be a, a guess on my part. What's your other question? The other question, uh, going back to the channeling, to the issue of channeling, I was wondering whether the book had actually been channeled. I've had the opportunity of working with people that do channeling. And what they do is basically the ego steps aside and they allow uh, entities from the spiritual realm to come in contact and they sort of uh, transmit this to this level. They, people that channel that present, they claim that uh, all the holy scriptures have actually been channeled and that when the Pope sits in the cathedral, what he does is he actually opens up to a spiritual realm and allows the spiritual energies to come through and to give messages to us at this level. Uh, so I was wondering whether uh, we could explore this a little bit more and, um, and relate this to the dead, to the presence of the dead, which is very, very strong, in, especially in scrutinies. And uh, especially considering that, like in the pre-Hispanic times, the dead were not considered to be uh, the rotten part of our reality, but they were actually a living entity, another level, another layer, another dimension of life. So I was wondering whether uh, one, if Jung, in one way or another, had opened up to this spiritual realm and uh, had allowed this information to flow through him. Um. Well, I guess you could call it a kind of modified channeling. <laughs> uh, in Liber Primus, at one point, he says to uh, some figures, I think it's to, if I recall correctly, to Elijah and Salome, he says, uh, well, you're just symbols. You're nothing but symbols. And they say, no, we're not. We're not just symbols. We're real. And so he had to change his mind about them and, and really open himself up to these uh, voices of the deep, as he calls them, uh, die Stimme der Tiefe, um, and, and let them speak, let them have their, at one point in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, he, he says he even gave his voice over to one of the figures, and she started speaking with his, with his voice. The difference is, as I understand channeling, I've never witnessed a channeling, or I've read about it, but I, I've never uh, come in close contact with a channeler, so I can't speak with any authority about this. But um, Jung argues with these figures, and he asks them questions, and he doesn't just accept at face value what they say. Um, he dismisses them sometimes. He uh, contradicts them. Um, he, uh, he really engages them, and that's what he says is the difference between active imagination and passive fantasy, maybe also channeling, in, is that the ego retains its position throughout and uh, addresses or interacts with the figures as you would if the person is sitting over here beside you. M more than you probably would if you were talking to a real person because Jung is rude to them. Uh, he's not in a persona. He's, uh, he's like, um, I don't know, a, a, an adolescent, you know, uh, uh, confronting his, his parents or his elders sometimes. You know, he's, he's right out there with them. Uh, and so you get this mixed quality of messages coming from the other world, from the other side, from spiritual figures, whatever you want to, uh, however you want to think about them. He would say figures from the unconscious, unconscious just being a word of that vague place. We don't know what it is or where it is, but it isn't anywhere in our world. Um, uh, this mixture between that material coming in and his very here and now modern consciousness. He's a modern man, and uh, he keeps his, uh, his rationality uh, when he talks to them. They speak in a very different way, but he doesn't. And so, you see, that's, that's why I, I wouldn't take this as channeling, nor this book as, as, a, as a prophecy or a Bible, except in a very, very um, special way that I'll try to spell out toward the end of this. How, how we should read this or how we could take it to, into, our, into our own perspectives and work with it uh, uh, as we move into the future ourselves or as the, as the collective, the culture 
moves forward. But um, it would be a mistake to take this as a, as a channeled scripture. It's not that. That isn't what Jung would have wanted us to do with it. I'm sure of that. Let me take an email question or two, and then we'll get back to, to Zurich. This one comes from our friends in Cleveland, and the question is, why did death become so important to Jung at a rather young age? Any thoughts on that, Murray? Sure. Uh, when, let me just get this. When Jung uh, has the experience of, this comes during the scrutinies, 19, uh, in 1914, July 26, 1914, this is after the uh, Secundus has ended, the Red Book part has ended, we're into scrutinies now. So J July 26th is Jung's birthday, he turns 39, 1914. July 26, 1915, uh, this is just toward the end of the long silence, about a year of silence, and this is when he's on the lake and he sees the bird and hears a voice, he turns 40. This is exactly his midlife, more or less exactly. 40, 43 would be more exactly his midlife. But, you know, at 40, 39 and 40, into, in his 40th year, coming into his 40th year, um, th these issues become very big and very critical. And who are the dead? We'll, we'll look at that later because they return to him with great force. They're unhappy. They're unsatisfied. They need something. And the seven sermons to the dead are trying to put them to rest, give them satisfaction. What do they want? They ask all kinds of questions. Finally, they get an answer that is sufficient and they can be, uh, they, can, they, can, they can go on to where they need to go. Um, now, we also have to keep in mind, while, uh, I mean, death anxiety, common experience at midlife. Many people have written about it, people talk about it, Jung wrote about it. As life turns from the first half into the second half of life, he says it reaches its apex, and then you're looking not so much forward anymore toward expansion and further ego development and building your empire, you're starting to look toward death. And so when social scientists and researchers have gone into the midlife crisis period, typically between the ages late 30s to mid 40s, uh, they've identified what they call a, a kind of death anxiety setting in that causes all kinds of disturbances uh, that people might act out of. They might, uh, you know, try to regain their youth. They might try to deny that they're going to die. They might, uh, like uh, some people, I, I shouldn't name any names, but great pub public political figures seem to think that they're immortal and they just go on and on. So you can deny it, but nevertheless, it's lurking in the background. What Jung did not do was deny his anxieties. This book is full of angst. Jung is anxious, uh, tremendously anxious, and, and to, the, to the very end. So he's, he's really uh, letting himself experience all of his, um, I'd say, appropriate, age-appropriate fears about death. That's one thing. The second thing is you have to remember that Scrutinies is taking place, uh, and the seven ser sermons take place, during the First World War. And this was a horrific time in Europe. Everybody knew it was the end of their civilization. And these young men were dying in the tens and hundreds of thousands on the battlefields of Europe for no reason. It was sheer stupidity. Uh, but the generals wouldn't stop, and they kept brilliant young men from Oxford and Cambridge and the great universities of Germany were gun fodder. And Jung feels for them. He sees them going down. They were, they were acquaintances or they're uh, children of his friends going down in this ghastly uh, uh, warfare that nobody in Europe would have ever thought was possible. It was like the end of the world. Um, and they knew it was the end of their civilization as they knew it, starting with August 1st, 1914. The world would never be the same again. Uh, little did they know it was going to get worse. It got even worse in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and so Jung had these premonitions of, of a terrible time to come. Europe freezing over, blood flowing across the map of Europe up to the Alps. Um, he was terribly anxious about what was going on in the world around him. And uh, so the, the spirits of the dead who come clamoring 
are the souls of those people who've died for nothing, for nothing, for no good reason. Uh, meaningless death is what haunts him, and uh, he, he can hardly bear it. So uh, that's where uh, the message of Philemon becomes so important to him, and uh, uh, to put this to rest in himself and for the collective, uh, because it was really a bad time in Europe. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you. Let me ask one more email question. We've got a number of email questions coming in, which is nice. And but then we probably ought to get back to the main presentation. And again, other email sites, you know, feel free to send us questions and we'll ask as many of them as we can. This one comes from Buffalo, New York and says, did Young time his descent into Libia Primus with November 12, 1913, i.e. 11, 12, 13, in any astrological sense, i.e. Scorpio, Hades, Dash, Pluto. Um, he, he doesn't uh, say anything about that, but it would be an interesting thing to study. Uh, I, I tried to look up some of these dates, the, the, the day of the week uh, on the calendar for those years, things like that, but I didn't look into astrology and I don't know enough about it. But uh, yeah, that date, 11, 12, 13 is interesting. Uh, uh, that's the beginning of it and then uh, the end of it, uh, June 1st, uh, 1916. But I don't know what's going on in the stars uh, during that period of time. I'll leave that to a, an astrologer like Liz Green or somebody to to uh, take that up. I'm sure they would have a lot to say about it. Uh, because a lot was going on in the world, not just in Jung's life, but the world at large was in a tremendous upheaval during that time. The other interesting thing to note about these years, um, if you look at, at cultural history, the the incredible works that were produced uh, between uh, 1912 and 1930, let's say 1922, 1925, in that period, you have Proust writing his great classic, you know, one of the great works of literature, considered by many the greatest uh, a novel of the 20th century was being written uh, in these years between 1912 and 1920, I think he died in 1922, uh, a Search for Things uh, Lost, Things Past, um, 1922, T.S. Eliot published The Wasteland. Um, and between 1912 and 1922, Rilke wrote the Duino Elegies. Um, I mean, you've got an incredible amount of rich cultural uh, production going on. The artists were very busy and the culture makers. Uh, and some of the greatest works of, of literature and art were produced in those years in, in many media, music, uh, poetry, uh, literature, painting, sculpture, and so on. So it was a very turbulent but very rich time uh, in European history. Well, thank you. Let me just add that our very first you know, conference with Murray Stein was August 8th, 2008, which was 8808, and we were very <laughs> pleased to have that uh, synchronistic <laughs> lineup with the stars <laughs> as well. So, so Murray, let's turn it back over to you. I'll let you decide. We still have many questions pending, but we'll get to those later. But I'll let you decide when you want to have us take the break, but you can either speak a little bit longer and break soon or whatever works for your schedule would be fine. So back to you, Murray. Let me speak for about 10 more minutes, and then we'll take the break, and then I'll continue speaking, and we'll get to some more questions. How's that? Yeah, uh, so that, the break would come right about in the middle of our time today. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So the scrutinies begins with this scrutiny of the ego. Uh, and that's the first thing that Jung addresses, and he addresses it very rigorously and very sharply. Then these resignations take place that I mentioned, and then the soul returns. But the soul says to him on May 8th, how far away you are. So she has disappeared for a period of time for some months, and now she says to him, how far away you are. Uh, and uh, they have a brief conversation. And in this conversation, she says to him, because he's obviously been having doubts about what he's done, these resignations going his own way, he can barely stand himself. Uh, she reassures him and, and hammers home to him the importance of going, going it alone, going his own way, the way of the solitary. And she says to him, Der unsichere Weg ist der gute Weg. Der unsichere Weg ist der gute Weg. The uncertain way is the good way. So he's, he's taken a path that with lots of uncertainties, with no 
no promises that of, uh, no guarantees of anything good to come, but she reassures him that this way is, is the right way, is the good way. And one must say that every creative personality has to face this, this kind of, uh, of uh, questioning and doubt. Is, is the way I'm, I'm taking, is what I'm doing, does it make any sense? Will it lead to anything? Is this nonsense? Uh, maybe I should go back into the, into the collective. Maybe I should take a job with a corporation. Maybe I should do something different. No, der unsicher Weg ist der gute Weg, she says. So she is very much supporting the path that he has found, which is the way of the solitary. Um, and on May 23rd, she remains at a great distance, and they have a, a discussion now about faith and knowledge, faith versus knowledge. And this is an important theme in Jung's life, uh, the difference between faith and knowledge. Um, and she says to him that faith uh, is, about, is, is, a, is a quality of childishness, childish belief, whereas knowledge is uh, grown up. Uh, now faith to be reduced to a childish state of belief is, is a bit extreme, but I want to explain what Jung meant by faith and how he understood that word, Glaube in, in German, die Glaube. And Glaube does mean belief. You believe something because somebody tells it to you. You believe it because of authority uh, given to it by somebody else, an external authority. Uh, and so children learn about their culture based on the authority of their teachers. Their teachers tell them uh, you know, what, uh, what their history is, tell them what their culture is, and, and introduce them to uh, science and mathematics without explaining the background. So you memorize formulas and you learn vocabulary. And, and in, in church, in the context of faith, you learn the stories from the Bible and you learn the creeds and you have your confirmation or your baptism and, and so on and so forth. And that's all done by learning what authority has to say. That's what Jung meant by Glaube, or, or faith, belief. He doesn't mean faith in, in a high theological sense of the word. So in contrast to that, you have knowledge. Knowledge is something that you acquire from your own experience. Uh, if you have knowledge of science, it's different from belief in science. Uh, you actually do science, and you know how it works, and you know its limitations. That's knowledge. Um, if you... Um, uh, if you uh, have a, uh, a relationship or, or you enter into a, a, a situation where you produce a family, uh, you don't believe in family life, you have knowledge of family life. And so uh, Jung wants to say the same thing about anything philosophical, anything metaphysical, anything uh, having to do with religion. What is the experience? Uh, experience is grown up, just taking it because somebody else says it on the basis of authority is childish. So that's what he means by faith. Um, and in the course of these experiences that he has in the Red Book, of course, he's going to come to ex he's going to come to experience the power and the and the uh, and come into a state of respect for the powers that he experiences. Uh, now you could say that's an, another kind of faith based on experience, but he doesn't use the word faith. He'll say, that's experience. I'm speaking of what I know from experience. That's knowledge. So that's the difference. And uh, this discussion with the soul uh, is, to my knowledge, the first, maybe, maybe there are earlier uh, distinctions like this that he makes in his writings, I don't know, but it, it comes to um, a tremendous uh, formulation uh, later in, in works like uh, Answer to Job, in his letters with Victor White, where they talk about the difference between faith and knowledge, in his dialogue with Martin Buber, and so on, um, that, uh, uh, and in the, in the famous uh, um, interview with John Freeman in 1958, face to face, where Freeman says, do you believe in God now, today, do you believe in God? And Jung stutters a little bit, and he says, I've, I've always had a hard time with belief. That word doesn't work for me. I don't believe, I know. 
Uh, and everybody was astonished uh, by that uh, expression. What does he know? Uh, how does he know? Uh, I'd like to know more about what he knows. Well, what he means by that is he's had experiences like the ones recorded in the Red Book. And when he speaks about those things, uh, the powers the, that be, the, the, uh, the archetypal images, uh, the gods and so on, whatever you want to call them, he's going to speak from experience and knowledge and not from belief, uh, having read about them somewhere. And what you, you could say that the Red Book is taking into his experience what he's read in his library to some extent. Uh, Sonu Shandasani, the editor, has traced a lot of the figures, figures and incidents in the Red Book to uh, passages in books in Jung's library. Uh, Jung was a, an avid reader of uh, philosophy, mythology, fairy tales, all that material. And in the Red Book, he comes to experience a lot of those uh, processes and uh, and to some extent figures. Elijah and Salome, for instance, are, are biblical figures. Uh, Isdabar is a version of Gilgamesh. Uh, there are scenes that uh, are reminiscent of uh, Scandinavian mythology or Greek mythology, Egyptian mythology. There are quotations from the Upanishads, all kinds of material in the Red Book. Uh, but Jung is taking it from the page into his experience and dialoguing with these figures. Uh, not in a systematic way, A to Z in his library, but they come to him. Uh, uh, he's, he's read about the Mithraic mysteries, and he has the experience of a Mithraic initiation. Uh, um, he hangs from the tree like Odin did, but now he can speak from experience uh, and not from uh, belief. And so that's a huge difference, this transition from childish belief, uh, very passively taking it in from authority figures or your readings, to actually experiencing it. Um, and then uh, toward the end of this period, uh, between May 25th and June 24th, 1914, just before the long pause of the break, uh, Jung says that he, that he is feeling, or he looks at himself and he says his ego, he is feeling burdened by a thousand dead. Uh, now this is just before the First World War breaks out. Uh, and I think it's a premonition of what is to come. Not that Jung was the only one to have, have this feeling that there was going to be a war, that it was imminent. The clouds were thick, the sky was darkening, lots of Europeans were anxious about what was to come. And then Jung had these horrific uh, visions of, of Europe freezing and the blood flowing over the map and, and so on. So this is a, a premonition of uh, the um, uh, uh, horrific slaughter that would take place in the war that was about to break out. So between May 25th and June 24th, for about a month in there, he felt tremendously burdened by the dead. Now these dead are going to become very important later when we get into the seven sermons. So I will stop now and we'll take a, a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and look at the sermons. Yes, thank you, Barry. We'll see you in 10 minutes. Okay, I think we're at 10 minutes from our side. We've still got stragglers coming in. So if we want to get going, Barry, that's fine. Or if you need another couple minutes, either way is good from us. Okay, well, we can go on. Um, okay. Let me remind you that uh, the Liber uh, Primus, uh, <clears throat> the first part of the Red Book, has a, a, a subtitle to it, or uh, Jung titled it, again, when he was working on these materials and divided them into three parts, and he gave titles and he added content, uh, he called the first one uh, Der Weg des Kommenden, the way of the coming, or the way of the future, or the way of the coming one, you could say. When you translate, you always have to make these terrible choices, and it flattens the uh, uh, it flattens the text. Uh, if you leave it in German, der Weg des Kommenden, there are several suggestions, but it does have to do with the future, either the way of the coming one, or the way of the coming, or the way of the future, way of the coming ones, uh, and that 
first one is the descent into the depth and he talks about uh, the, the descent into the future so there's a kind of uh, uh, forward-looking uh, visionary quality to uh, some of his um, uh, <coughs> active imagination materials the second uh, book uh, Liber Secundus is titled uh, Der Weg des Irrenden the way of the erring the way of the erring ones the way the wrong path going down the wrong path not the right path but the wrong path the way of erring and um, <clears throat> uh, in that he uh, confronts uh, a lot of these figures who uh, um, uh, he uh, learns things from dialogues with ends up uh, giving birth or rebirth to a couple of gods. Uh, they ascend. Uh, Isdubar, after the incantations, is resuscitated. He revives. He goes up into heaven, becomes a sun god. The sun, after the fairy tale, uh, the sun also ascends. Uh, and then everything is covered up. Um, and he's all by himself at the end of the Liber Secundus. Uh, that's called Der Weg des Irrenden. And uh, let me start this section of the seminar with a quotation from Memories, Dreams, Reflections that picks up on this. And Jung, now in old age, is commenting on looking back on these experiences. And he says, It is, of course, ironical that I, a psychiatrist, should at almost every step of my experiment have run into the same psychic material, which is the stuff of psychosis. That was the question that was asked a few minutes ago, and is found in the insane. This is the fund of unconscious images which fatally confuse the mental patient. But it is also the matrix of a mythopoetic imagination which has vanished from our rational age. Let me say that again. It's the matrix of a mythopoetic imagination which has vanished from our rational age. So there you have two qualities, rationality in the age and the mythopoetic imagination that has vanished. Though such imagination is present everywhere, people still have it, it is both tabooed and dreaded, so that it even appears to be a risky experiment or a questionable adventure to entrust oneself to the uncertain path that leads into the depths of the unconscious. It is considered the path of error. That's Der Weg des Irrenden that he wrote about so many years earlier. It is considered the path of error to go into the depths of the unconscious or to engage in uh, poetic, uh, mythopoetic imagination. Path of error, of equivocation and misunderstanding. I'm reminded of Goethe's words. Goethe was you know, the great, uh, basically equivalent to Shakespeare in German culture, the great poet of the German uh, people. I'm reminded of Goethe's words, quote, Now let me dare to open wide the gate, past which men's steps have ever flinching trod, unquote. Flinching trod, not unflinching trod, and flinching, fearfully trod. So opening up the gates. Unpopular, this is Jung again, unpopular, ambiguous, and dangerous. It is a voyage of discovery to the other pole of the world. And this is from MDR, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, page 189, if you want to look up the reference. Um, so what is doing here is taking a journey to the other pole of the world, to the, the, the pole that we would call the, the mythopoetic imagination or the unconscious. He's using his imagination, giving image to figures and processes that are located in the unconscious and uh, letting them speak. So where we've got him now is in scrutinies uh, up to the period of silence in uh, between the summer, basically the summer of 1914 and the summer of 1915. The summer of 1915, Jung turns 40 years old. And while he's on the water, he says, 
in the Red Book. Um, while he was out on the water and he was, uh, he loved to sail. He lived on the lake. Uh, he has a sailboat next to his house, keeps his sailboat there. And if he has a little extra time or on weekends, he goes out sailing uh, out on Lake Zurich. And so while out on the water one day in the summer of 1915, he sees a kingfisher bird uh, flying overhead and it dives into the water and brings up a large fish. And then he hears a voice, and he says it's the voice of the soul. The voice says, now, <clears throat> I don't know what he means by hear a voice. Is that an auditory hallucination, or is it a kind of metaphoric way of saying I had a thought, a vivid thought? Anyway, he says the voice is the voice of the soul, and it says, she says, this is a sign. What is below will be brought up. That's the message. What is below will be brought up. So here you have an instance of an act of imagination, so to speak, <clears throat> uh, the voice combining with an actual event and saying this is a meaningful event, bringing the fish up. It's symbolic. This is a symbolic event. And his mythopoetic imagination now is going to go to work on it. What does this mean? <clears throat> so soon after that, <clears throat> Uh, in, uh, soon after the, that, uh, that incident, Philemon appears to him. Now Philemon, who plays such an important role in scrutinies and really is the central figure next to Jung himself uh, and, and the soul, but Philemon appears in Liber Secundus. Philemon appeared too. Jung went in search of the magician. He came to the home of Philemon and Bacchus. He asked Philemon a few questions. What about magic? What is magic? How do you use magic? And Philemon explains it to him. He says it's, it's basically the knowledge of the irrational, the knowledge that science cannot explore, that reality is made up of rational and irrational experiences and facts. Science is limited to what is rational, and magic can make intelligible the irrational. That's Philemon's message to Jung. That's what magic is. It makes the irrational intelligible. In other words, it's the mythopoetic imagination. It's, uh, it's what can give form and image and intelligibility, that is coherence and structure, uh, to um, what can't be discovered by uh, scientific methods. So mythopoetic imagination is the magic, and Philemon is the magician. Now Philemon reappears, and becomes a much more important figure in scrutinies than he was before. He was kind of incidental before, important, but not central. Now he becomes central. And he says that he is shaping and forming CG. I, I refer to Jung as CG. Tsege, uh, he called himself um, for short. Uh, shaping and forming him, dominating him, and stamping him like a coin, turning him into a coin of the realm that can be exchanged, sought after, of high value that need not prove itself, made of gold. And so he's going to be able to pass the test of the Prufstein if he's of real solid gold. Okay, so this is, Philemon is busy working on him in the background. And Jung discovers later in this section that Philemon has been behind all of these fantasies. He is the, the architect of the whole thing, of the whole show. He's the author. And Philemon, uh, you could say, is the playwright and the um, producer of the drama that Jung has entered into. And um, he's using this drama to shape Jung and form him into a highly valuable and something that will be much sought after um, substance of gold, the highest value. He's working on Jung's um, identity and his consciousness. You remember that Jung couldn't stand himself, couldn't bear his narcissistic character, and uh, Philemon is helping him grow, him grow himself up, educate him, and bring him up to, up, to, up to standard, up to the standard of gold, high standard. At first, Jung is confused with what he means by this. He asks him some questions. Philemon refuses to answer and disappears. Then, 
on September 18, 1915, uh, Philemon comes back and there is an interesting conversation about um, the relation of the self to God. Now in Jungian circles, um, there's often uh, a question is raised, is the self the same as God? Is the self God? Is, is, when Jung writes about the self and we capitalize self, is that really a reference to what religious people call God? Is there something transcendent about the self? Is it metaphysical? Well, here Jung answers that question. Um, and in, in, in this dialogue with Philemon, um, he says, uh, through union with the self, when the ego unites with the self, and you know the difference between ego, ego is the limited in time and space, self is the totality of the psyche, conscious and unconscious. When, the, when, when we unite with the self, we reach God. We reach God, okay? We come in contact with, we can touch God. But the self is not God. There's a difference between the self and God. God is higher, broader, more uh, transcendent. The self is imminent. It is housed in us, in our psyche. But if we come in contact with it and we unite with it, we come in contact with God. But God is not the self. God is behind the self and greater than the self. And so it's very important to keep this in mind that uh, uh, Jung makes a distinction between God, the high God, the, the, the transcendent God, and the self. Now, Philemon goes on to say that, that he, Jung, should live more deeply in God. In other words, he should bring the self as much as he can into contact with God, which means he should live a religious life. He should live close to... Uh, a sense of the numinous, close to the divine, close to the deity. That's the place to live. Um, and Philemon encourages him uh, to get close, but uh, he can't merge. He's not advocating mystical states necessarily, but he's advocating a sense of presence that uh, Jung would live close to, would live close to God, that the self and God would come close and the ego could experience this transcendence in that way. Now, uh, at this point, Jung realizes that he and Philemon are quite different, separate, separate voices, and that Philemon speaks in this highly exalted uh, language of the archetypes, a mythopoetic language, a kind of uh, um, archaic language, and that they are indeed very different, but that uh, Philemon is capable of intoxicating him a rausch. He speaks of a rausch. That means you become intoxicated with the, with the archetypal energy. And it's like a state of exaltation or inflation. And um, Jung could get into this once in a while uh, when he would speak. And he'd give uh, off-the-cuff talks. Uh, he uh, would sort of get full of, of uh, inspiration. And people would say, wow, that's... Uh, that was like like listening to like listening to the self talk, like listening to God talk or something. Jung called it das S S spricht durch mich. It speaks through me, and so this is the voice of Philemon, and um, we'll look a little more carefully at who Philemon is and what he represents. Basically, he's turning out to be a kind of teacher, and he tells Jung about self. What self is not God. God is greater than the self, but you can come in contact with God through, through the self, if you're close to the self. And so Jung is beginning to get these teachings about how to live a religious life in modernity, in the modern world. And this is Jung's basic question. This is where this thing started. At the beginning of Confrontation of the Unconscious in MDR, uh, chapter 6 of Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung says, uh, I realized I had no myth. I got very uncomfortable. I have no myth to live by. And so there's a quest to find a myth to live by, which means having a myth to live by meaning, means that you live with meaning, you live with a numinous, you feel close to uh, the deity, divine presence is in your life. You know, that's what people talk about, living close to God, so on. But in his modernity, in his modern consciousness, Jung couldn't do this in a traditional way. He's finding an untraditional way, the wrong way, the wrong path to discover 
a kind of religion for modern men, you could say modern men and women, who have fallen out of their religious tradition, can no longer believe from authority, can experience, however, and can gain knowledge, this might be a path for them. And that's what I'm going to suggest at the end of this, that if you follow the Red Book as a model, you know, and not to imitate it, but it offers a, uh, a kind of solution to the problem of people in modernity hungry for spirituality and for um, the numinous, but can't find it in their religious traditions, in their creeds and the teachings and their beliefs anymore. Is there another way to go? Well, that's what Philemon is teaching Jung, and that's what he's going to teach in the Seven Sermons. Then, uh, between December 2nd and January 11th, Jung has a conversation with a woman who comes out of the shades. He says three shades appear, and she steps forward, and she demands a symbol. She says, I have to have a word, I have to have a symbol. And I'm not going to go into detail about this, but uh, he finds that he has a symbol to offer her, and they get into quite a long and interesting discussion about um, the, uh, the body, about the, uh, the lower, you could say, the, the instinctual realm and how that is also sacred, how that is a way, uh, the way of the erring, that is a way to, uh, uh, but the other pole, it's via the other pole also to the gods, to the deity. Uh, and she calls for community. Now that's an interesting point. Uh, Jung has been so intent on the way of the solitary um, and now he's going to start coming into uh, uh, confrontation with the question, what about community? What about being with other people? What about love? Uh, uh, that's a question that haunted him toward the end of the, of the Liber Secundus also. And remember, he got the crown that says love is eternal. And so the, the problem of love, if you will, the problem of love was broached, and now it's going to be developed. She calls for community. A community, she says, that includes the dead, the living and the dead. And she says, it's one of the mistakes of modern people to have cut themselves off from the spirits, from the ancestor spirits, from the dead. That in modern times, we no longer pay attention to the ancestors. So this is the first time in human history that people haven't paid attention to their ancestor and to the spirits, to the dead. Um, and to this day, <clears throat> At my school here in Zurich, at ISAP, uh, we have a number of students from other countries and cultures, and uh, I've asked a number of them what, what do they do about ancestors in their cultures, and from Japan and China especially, I get an interesting answer. In every home, you find an altar uh, off to the side somewhere, often with a picture of Buddha or one of the, one of the uh, fa favorite deities in that culture. Um, China and, and Japan, it would be Buddha, most likely. And then there is a bowl with some food in it, and then there is a, a, an object, sometimes a stick uh, with a number of engravings on it, uh, or a piece of paper that is inserted into uh, a bottle, um, and put uh, the food put in front of it, and prayers first to the Buddha image, and then to this, and these are the names of the ancestors. And when your parents die, uh, you've taken care of them in their old age, they pass away, you put their names on there and they join the ancestors and you honor them and you feed them and you think about them, you pray to them. And she says, this, she turns out to be the soul figure, she says this community that you build, and she insists that he start a community or he become involved in a community, has to include the dead. The living and the dead have to come together. So she's advocating for this kind of very traditional or ancient, archaic practice of remembering the dead and keeping them present. And she calls them and stages a kind of Last Supper. This is, a, of course, an echo from Jung's Protestant Christian background, the Last Supper of Jesus and his disciples. So one that's celebrated in the Mass, Catholic Mass and the Christian Communion. Uh, <clears throat> which is a kind of recognition and honoring of the dead who have passed before and have, have sacrificed for us and 
passed on their on the heritage. So she calls them and they celebrate a kind of Last Supper. And um, uh, in a way she calls on Jung to become a close to something like a prophet and the founder of a new church or a new religion. Now, some years ago, Richard Knoll wrote a book called The Jung Cult, and he argued in that book that Jung, during this period of time, really was intent on starting a new religious cult, and that uh, he wanted to um, base, base his, his religion on, on Mithraic ideas and Mithraism and so on. And it was a, uh, um, an interesting book from one point of view, well-researched, but terribly distorted and, and wrong-headed uh, in another sense. Uh, in that it took uh, took this to be so concrete. Jung would have never thought of founding a religion, and we'll see in a minute exactly why. He was a modern person. He wasn't, and he, and he had a, a, a great distaste of uh, mobs and large collectives, and he never wanted to found a Jung Institute in Zurich, for example, because he didn't like the idea of of um, uh, a kind of regulated uh, teaching and training uh, it was too far from der Weg des Irrenden, too far from the way that he found so valuable, which is very individual, very private, and very solitary. Um, analysis comes much closer because it's just one-to-one. -one. Each person is different. Each one has their own experiences with their dreams and their uh, transferences and so on and so forth. But you get into a collective and into a group group think, group mentality, uh, Jung was very averse to that. On the other hand, there is a need for a community, and she speaks for it, okay, because she speaks for Eros, and she speaks for the body. You have to embody somehow your fellow feeling and, and uh, a sense for, uh, for a community, and to eat together, to have a last supper. Interestingly, Jung uh, rejects that idea of being a prophet and founding a, a community and so on. And Philemon now enters and says, watch out for her. And he warns Jung not to get too close to this uh, female figure, this anima, because she's going to lead him astray. She's going to seduce him into something that he really isn't meant to do. He shouldn't do. So Philemon says to him, never let her out of your sight. Always stay in touch with her. But she belongs to another realm. She belongs to the realm of the, of the, uh, of the gods and the daimons, and she doesn't belong to your world. And she will suck you out of it. She will take everything out of it. She will take your blood. She'll take your emotion. And, um, and you're, then you're lost on the, on the one hand. On the other hand, if you lose sight of her, you're a lost soul too. So you have to keep track of her, but don't, uh, don't identify with her and don't take everything that she has to say at face value. That's Philemon's advice. Um, and then uh, the soul comes back, this woman comes back, and she says to Jung, you've been called for. You have to make an appearance before Abraxas. And that's the first time this name has come up, which becomes so important in the seven sermons, Abraxas, and we'll take a look at that. She says, Abraxas wants to speak to you. Uh, and you are meant to serve Abraxas. Jung objects to this. He says, who's Abraxas? I don't know who that is. Uh, doesn't want anything to do with it. Is kind of afraid of it. Here's anxiety comes in. Again, where are you trying to take me? What are you telling me? And then this crowd of souls comes to the door one night and the souls now of the dead have arrived. Okay, and Philemon comes and she says to Jung, Philemon will speak to the souls. Now this appearance of the souls of the dead is exactly dated uh, January, I believe it's between January 29th and February 8th of 1916. Uh, the the seven sermons to the dead are spoken by Philemon. Uh, Philemon is the preacher, and he's the teacher, and he's the prophet. Uh, Jung describes the appearance of the, these souls in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, the souls of the dead, but it's not exactly the same as 
in the Red Book. There's a difference in, in season. He says it was a summer day, on a summer day, on a Sunday afternoon. He says uh, it was as though the house was filled with spooks. There was something really terribly, uh, 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 the air was full of them. We could, you know, we could hardly breathe in the house. He was in there with his family. And then they heard the front doorbell ring and they went to see and nobody was there. And then the maid looked and saw that the bell was being pulled. It was one of those pull bells, you know, and you could see it move, but there was nobody out there. Very spooky situation. And then the spirits of the dead come and say, we have arrived and uh, we are unsat we have returned from Jerusalem and we are unsatisfied. That's, that's how it begins, uh, Seven Sermons to the Dead. Now, the Seven Sermons to the Dead, which I want to go into a bit now, um, have been known to us since the publication of Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Um, they were included as an appendix in the paperback version of Memories, Dreams, Reflections that Anil Ayafe published in 1961. And they are, uh, in English at least, the translation of this, this book called Septum Seven Sermones Ad Mortuus. Shortly after, uh, right in the middle of this business, uh, well, it ends on February 8th. Uh, the Seven Sermons to the Dead actually conclude, the entries in the Black Books conclude on February 8th. On February 11th, uh, a psychological clubhouse is rented on Levenstrasse 1 in Zurich. And on February 26th, there's a formal founding of the psychological club in Zurich with 40 members. Now this is, you could, you could see this as the community that the soul was advocating in that previous uh, message. For how long it was, had been brewing that there would be a psychological club, I don't know. I imagine it was in the air, there was a, there was a, um, a psychoanalytic society that was transformed into an analytical psychology group uh, in the, you know, starting about 1912 to 1915. Then in 1916, the Psychological Club, February 26th, is formally founded with 40 members. And Edith McCormick Rockefeller, a Chicago heiress from John D. Rockefeller, daughter of John D. Rockefeller, and married to the heir of the McCormick fortune in Chicago, was living in Zurich throughout the First World War in analysis with Jung. And she was a, a famous, um, um, uh, uh, benefactor of artists, including James Joyce, who also lived in Zurich at the time. James Joyce, incidentally, was writing Ulysses during the same period of time. I think it was published also in the early 1920s, another masterpiece of European literature. <clears throat> and she uh, rented a very fancy building on Levenstrasse, just down the street from where I'm sitting here, including a billiard room and uh, rooms that you that members could spend the night when they came into Zurich from, from uh, the suburbs or other towns, and uh, modeled on the idea of an English club. It was called the Psychological Club. And the members uh, who made up the club were all associates of Jung, either students of his or anal analyzans of his, but members of an inner circle and they formed the membership of the club. And that club um, still exists today, the Psychological Club. They moved their location, however. That was way too grandiose, the one on Levenstrasse, way too big. It had a kitchen, she hired a cook. Uh, but nobody used it. The, the Swiss don't use clubs like the English do. And so it lost a lot of money, and they saw it wasn't necessary. So she bought a house instead on Gemeindestrasse, which is about six blocks from here. Um, and to this day, the Psychological Club owns that house and in, in 2016 will celebrate its 100th anniversary. Uh, it has continued. I'm a member of the club. Andreas Schweitzer is the president of the club. It holds meetings, lectures. There's a Christmas party every year. People eat together, socialize a bit, um, and uh, 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 to a certain extent share their experiences. They to, to become a member of the club, you have to be sponsored by another member, two members who stand as your godparents. You have to show evidence of having individuated extensively. 
that you've been in analysis, you've had dreams, uh, all of that's basic requirements. You don't have to have an academic education. Some people are relatively uneducated uh, academically. They might have a bachelor's degree or maybe not even have attended university. That doesn't matter. It's not, it's not intellectual in that sense. It's a place for searching people, people with soul, people with an interest and uh, in, in depth psychology and particularly in Jung. And so they gather to this day, there is a community there. That's the community I think that the soul was advocating that Jung was rather reluctant to form, but did uh, in 1916. And uh, just after the seven sermons were finished, and as a present to Edith McCormick Rockefeller uh, for donating the money that is still in the endowment of the club to this day, they've been very careful with their funds, haven't overspent like most of us do, haven't invested in bad bonds. Uh, they still have uh, some money left from her original donation. And uh, in, in recognition of her gift and her generosity, Jung had this little book printed. And it's called The Seven Sermons to the Dead, and he made a limited number. This is one of the originals. And you can see it's printed in a, a kind of Gothic script, quite pretty. Uh, and he distributed this uh, to, gave her the honorary first copy and distributed it to the members. And I don't know how many copies there are in existence. If you find one on the market, maybe eBay or someplace, you probably have to pay $1,000 for it, something like that today. It's relatively rare and relatively valuable. That's the seven <laughs> sermons to the dead. Now, what are they? Well, the dead come and Philemon begins preaching to them. And uh, just before all of this takes place, Jung begins also drawing mandalas. And his first mandala is included in the Red Book uh, in Appendix A. And it's a very interesting cosmograph. It looks like this. That's in Appendix A of the Red Book with an explanation of what it means at the bottom. And basically, what this is, is a, is a cosmographic um, uh, picture of the various figures, forces, powers that Jung has experienced beforehand, arranged in an orderly way, uh, horizontally and vertically. And you'll have to read the explanation of what the what the uh, uh, cosmograph means to see how it uh, really summarizes uh, and puts together into a pictorial, pictorial form uh, a kind of coherent structure of the world, the cosmos, that Jung has been experiencing in his active imaginations. Uh, just after he finishes that, that's his first major mandala, he does a lot more in the, in the months and years to come, uh, which some, some of which are also included in here. Um, he uh, has the experience of listening to Philemon give the seven sermons. And so I want to just give you a brief rundown of what they are. If I can find my notes. I'm not going to go into detail on this because this would be a whole seminar in itself, but I'm going to say that these hungry ghosts who come um, become identified. What you get in the Red Book that is not in, in this tidy little uh, pamphlet is uh, Philemon's uh, input. And here uh, it says that this is um, translated out of the Greek into the German language, and the speaker is Basilides, a Gnostic teacher of the second century. In the Red Book, it's Philemon. And Philemon gives the teachings in, of Deutsch in German, not in Greek. It's a little bit of a spoof in there, making it look more antique than it really is. Uh, but uh, Philemon uh, addresses these spirits of the dead. And then there's, between each of the sermons, there is a dialogue between Jung and Philemon. In the first sermon, Philemon talks about the pleroma and the creatura. And the pleroma is the totality of everything, but without any distinctions in it. It's like a great soup, cosmic soup, that hasn't formed into planets or objects yet. 
but it is the foundation of, it's the all. It's the unformed cosmos, the potential for a cosmos. Jung would uh, later call that the collective unconscious. That's basically uh, a, uh, uh, the pleroma is a, a, a way of talking about the collective unconscious in potentia. And then objects form in this soup, and those are the creatures. And among these creatures is man, woman, the human is one of the creatures, but also the gods are creatures. So the, the gods and the god are lesser entities than the pleroma because they're distinct. Anything that is distinct, anything that has a definition, and all the gods of, of religious history have, have names, they're distinct, they are not the pleroma. They're made out of the pleroma. They come from the pleroma. Some of them represent large extension, extents of the pleroma, but none of them is as great as the pleroma. The pleroma is the cosmos. It's everything. It's, it's more than the planets. It's, I don't know, more. Uh, it's, it's what, uh, what, the, uh, what the universe was before there was a big bang. All potential. And then out of that, there congeal and emerge various entities that have definition and form. Those are called the creatura. That's sermon one. Well, the dead hear this and they uh, are not satisfied at all. They scream and they shout and they're very unhappy. Uh, they said, well, we didn't come for this and they disappear. And then Jung says to Philemon, well, why did you teach them this? They don't, they don't want to hear this. And Philemon says, well, um, I am speaking, and this is very interesting, uh, I am speaking from what I know. I am just saying what I know. I'm speaking from knowledge. Now this speaking from knowledge is what we talked about earlier, difference between belief and knowledge or faith and knowledge. I'm speaking from what I know and this I know. So everything that Philemon says in the seven sermons is knowledge. And he doesn't explain a lot. He doesn't say, how, how long did it take for these creatura to come into being? Who made them? You don't get a Genesis story. You don't get explanatory, causal, you know, and say, the first day God did this, second day he did that, and then he did that because that happened, and then Adam and then Eve. None of that. So he isn't giving you explanations because he doesn't know that. That's not knowledge. That's, that's mythology or belief or something else. No, he's not giving you that. He's just giving you what he knows. And what he knows is that in the beginning there's all potential and then things appear. And these things that appear are distinct and they have names and we call them gods and we call them daimons and we call them devils and they make up basically the inner world. These are the archetypal figures, the complexes, the ego structure. So the psyche is taking form. He doesn't put it in psychological language, that's my language, but Jung would later state it in that way. Okay, that's the first sermon. And the second sermon, they come back and they want to know about the gods. And he teaches them about the gods and he teaches, teaches them about um, how the gods are organized. And there Abraxas comes up powerfully. And he says there's a good god and there's a bad god. These are two distinct gods, uh, the devil and, and the good god, the god of love and the god of, of, of destruction. Uh, and these, this is a pair of gods, but higher than them or more fundamental than they are is Abraxas. Well, what is Abraxas? It says Abraxas is pure effectiveness. Abraxas is effective, uh, uh, just effectiveness. Effectiveness, it's an abstraction. What he means is it's uh, energy. It's basically the energy that can be put to work to make things. So uh, both of these other gods, the good god and the bad god, have uh, Abraxas behind them, they have energy, but Abraxas is more fundamental than they are. What Abraxas does for Jung, and in his quotes, emerging theology, is he unites the opposites, good and bad. And this is uh, something that Jung is going to hold on to uh, through the end of his life, through his arguments and break with uh, Victor White, that you cannot separate, uh, uh, you cannot say that God is all good you have to also say there's a good God, there's a bad God, maybe there's a higher God, a Godhead behind them, but uh, you can't, uh, he could never go along. He hated the idea of the teaching of privatio boni, that evil is nothing but the privation of good, and that God is all good and all light, and in him there is no evil, and he, and God is the pleroma. This 
Jung would say is a total mistake. Um, and uh, he, Abraxas is closer to the Pleroma, but Abraxas also isn't the Pleroma. Abraxas is definite, is distinct. Abraxas is the effectiveness of the Pleroma, the energy in the Pleroma that can get things done, that can do work, but it has an opposite, ineffectiveness. Now that would be a void. Jung doesn't talk about that, uh, and uh, Philemon doesn't talk about it. It's just mentioned. Again, when the spirits of the dead get these teachings, they're not satisfied. So then, it, then Jung asks about them, and, and Philemon tells him who the spirits of the dead are. Uh, who are these people? And I, I wondered that uh, myself. Who are the spirits of the dead? Is this Jung's father? Is this his ancestors that can't come to rest somehow? He, you know, when Jung speaks about his father, he says he was a very unhappy man. He was torn by the conflict between science and religion. He could never settle the question. He died at an early age uh, in a rather bad way. And maybe that is one of the unsatisfied dead. That was one of my thoughts. Well, what comes out of the dialogue with Philemon is that this, these souls who've gone to Jerusalem and are unsatisfied and are coming for, for some, some relief or something further are the souls of the dead who have died without faith. In other words, all the modern people who have died outside of faith, outside of their traditional faith systems, who have not died with the feeling of having a destiny after their death. Nowhere to go. You die and now what? It's empty. It's blank. And these are the souls who didn't know what to do, didn't know, they had nowhere to go. And they're wandering, uh, unsatisfied from hither to yon, and looking for a teaching that will finally release, release them and, re, and relieve their their suffering so that they can go on to something, somewhere. So I'm thinking of these souls now as all the people who've died during the Enlightenment, post-Enlightenment, modernity. These are all the people who've died outside the faith, outside the assurance that you have an immortal soul, and when you die, you're going somewhere. You've got a destiny. You've got a home in eternity somewhere. These are people who die without a sense of eternity. They're lost in temporality. They live only in the ego. They have no contact with, uh, the, with the infinite, with what we would call the ultimate God, Godhead, God figure. And so these are the ones who are coming. And, and through the sixth sermon, they are unsatisfied and they howl and they complain that he's not giving them what he wants because he's giving them a lot of philosophy. He's giving them cosmographies giving them cosmologies, that's not what they want. That doesn't satisfy them, this kind of knowledge. What they want is a connection to their destiny, to their home. Finally, in the seventh sermon, Philemon tells them what, what they have come to, uh, what they have come to, to, to uh, ask for. And he says that at the zenith, there is a star. And every individual has a connection to their own star. And the star is their eternal home. Uh, he says the star is at an immeasurable distance. It's blue. Uh, but when you die, that's where you have to go. You have to go to your star. And that is your eternal home. And once they hear this, and they know where to go, uh, they're connected to time has come into contact with eternity. Finally, these souls have a, a, a destination, have a, an orientation, and they disappear like the smoke uh, of a, uh, it's a wonderful poetic phrase that Jung uses, if I can find it quickly, the smoke of a shepherd's fire as he tends his flocks by night. Um, and this disappearance uh, of the, of the uh, hungry ghosts into eternity uh, is the 
is the solution to their problem. Now they're quiet and they're gone. And so the ser seven sermons come to, a, come to a, an end and uh, Philemon um, is, has been successful in communicating to them and to Jung what is uh, the destiny of the soul. And this point of making contact with eternity uh, you could say is a solution to Jung's problem too. When he started out with no myth, uh, no myth to live by, what he was saying was he was a modern person. He'd fallen out of his religious tradition. He couldn't orient himself by his Christian uh, heritage. It didn't work for him anymore. Um, he'd known that for quite a long time. He went into psychiatry, he went into Freud. That didn't work for him. Freudian psychology worked for a while, but he couldn't really believe in that myth. Psychiatry had nothing to offer at all. It's very flat, very scientific, descriptive. Doesn't say anything about the eternal soul, about immortality, nothing. So that part of him was left very unsatisfied. And uh, you could say that these clamoring souls are Jung's own hunger and need to have an orientation to eternity and uh, not to live only within the time-bound ego. Modernity is the time-bound ego. And uh, that isn't enough. That isn't good enough, at least for a person like Jung. And Jung would say it's probably not good enough for anybody, really, if you go deeply into what your soul needs and longs for and what, you, uh, uh, what you're hungry for, you need some sort of connection to uh, not just something beyond yourself, that's easy to find, projects and nations and ideologies, but you need, you need a connection to eternity. And uh, that's the, um, uh, the star that uh, um, uh, Philemon refers to. And there's a wonderful dream that Jung records, I think it's in 1946 or 1947, in a letter to Victor White. And Victor White, uh, a Dominican priest, a man of religious faith, a teacher at Oxford of Thomistic theology and philosophy, um, wanted to make a bridge between psychology and Roman Catholic theology. And so they, he struck up a relationship with Jung and they became close friends. And there's a correspondence published now, which uh, has also been performed and is recorded on DVD. You can, you can buy the recording from uh, the Asheville Jung Center. Uh, it's a wonderful performance by some Zurich analysts. In a letter, uh, just after he had a heart attack in 1946, um, and almost died for the second time, had a, had a heart attack also in 1944, so his health wasn't good. As he's recovering, he writes to Victor White, and he says in this letter, um, I had a wonderful dream a few nights ago. I dreamt that there was a star. I saw a star, a blue star, reflected in a pool. Um, if I can quote it, heaven above, heaven below. And I knew that I was a contained uh, part, a contained part of an immeasurable field, expanse of suffering, but I was contained. And this sense of a link between the star above and his self, the self, the ego self below, is an echo of that seventh sermon to the dead that Philemon uh, gave him at, uh, 10, 30, 30 odd years earlier. So I think Jung carried this notion for himself, uh, this image of a star as uh, a symbol of our eternal home uh, in the back of his consciousness and it came forward in a dream. He said, this dream gave me great comfort. So even though he was suffering and he was afraid of uh, declining health in those years, although he still, he says, there still is some light flicker, flickering, like the light of, of uh, lightning on a summer night in the back of my mind. And I think these are the thoughts that still remain to be brought out, but they're not my thoughts, they're the thoughts. Uh, they're the thoughts of God, as are all thoughts that are of any importance, 
he says. So he really, by that part, time in his life, had developed a, a very strong feeling for this connection to uh, uh, the what is beyond uh, beyond knowing, the mystery, uh, beyond the self, beyond the ego, uh, but that one can connect to in, in a symbolic way. So I want to leave a little time for questions before we wind this up. Can we take 15 minutes for questions, Steve? Yes, that sounds good. Thank you, Murray. There are a number of email questions, and then if we have time, I'd like to, to offer you know, the live sites to uh, chime in as well. First question comes from California, and this is actually a friend of yours, Murray, who I'm told will see you next week in Zurich. So this is Tom Kirsch. Tom and Kirsch. He, Tom. <laughs> right. Tom is a author. He wrote the book Jungians, came out a number of years ago. Excellent book on the history of the the Jungian folks, he's an analyst in California. His question is, this is the first time that Jung speaks about a transcendent God through what Philemon says. In most of his writings, he is cautious about speaking about a transcendent being. He usually speaks about the self-image or the God image and never about the transcendent God. This is a very important point from Philemon. Could you comment more about this? Uh, Tom's absolutely right. Uh, Jung was often challenged, um, you know, about uh, his, uh, quotes, God talk. And um, he reflected on God images quite a lot in his writings. Uh, and he would always say, I'm not talking about God, I'm talking about God images. And these God images appear in time in certain cultures and they change and they... Um, uh, he also saw the God image of, of uh, the, the biblical tradition changing in our time, and he had some ideas about how it could change to be more inclusive, to include the feminine and to include the body and to include uh, the dark side, the shadow side of God, so at a quaternity image. But he's always talking very carefully, framing it. I'm talk not talking about God, I'm talking about God images. Now, in the Red Book, he doesn't make this distinction because he's not speaking uh, in the first place to the public. He's just letting himself have experiences and thoughts. And it is the case that he never published the Red Book in his lifetime. And uh, it was like a great secret, a mystery. And people thought, what's in that book that he's keeping it so secret? And why doesn't he... Uh, publish it and why can't we see it and there were all kinds of speculations and fantasies about what was in there and I think he hesitated to publish it because precisely because he is not so careful about making these kinds of modern you know <laughs> rational distinctions he's just talking about experience and the way it comes to him when Philemon talks and talks about God beyond the self greater than the self uh, uh, that's Philemon talking, and Jung is just writing it down and recording it. Um, and uh, I think uh, that is closest to what Jung himself really um, believed and felt. Believed, I shouldn't use that word, experienced. Uh, when he said, I don't believe, I know, he was talking about this kind of... Uh, experience and material. So uh, in the, uh, I wrote an essay uh, that was published in the Journal of Analytical Psychology a couple of years ago, picking up on a phrase that uh, Jung uh, drops very quietly in, in the middle of a lot of other material uh, in uh, Mysterium Conjunctionis, his last great work. And uh, there he talks about uh, the imago dei, the soul of man, the human image, the self, uh, is an imago dei, a union of opposites, unio oppositorum. Uh, this idea of imago dei uh, is a traditional idea that man, human be humankind is created in the image of God. In God's image, he created them, male and female, he created them according to Genesis. He created humans in his own image. God's image. So the idea of imago dei, that human somehow, the human being, uh, as constituted um, 
in uh, uh, historic times um, is uh, reflective of or, uh, the um, uh, of the divine, but is not the divine. Is a reflection of, is an image of, the human is an image of, the divine. That's a theological idea, and Jung subtly inserts that into uh, this passage that uh, that I picked up and, and wrote about, and and it really does imply, in the back of Jung's mind, not explicitly stated and brought out because he's being scientific and careful and scholarly and modern, uh, is the idea that there is a God behind the human whose reflection we are, whose reflection the self is. So when he says in the Red Book, if you, you can unite with the self, you come close to God. In other words, when you get close to your, your complexity, your, un, your unity, your completeness, your wholeness, you're also getting closer to the God who lies behind that. And that was his way. That was the way to the numinous for him. Tom, I hope I <laughs> said something relevant to your question. Thanks. Well, you can ask him next week when you see him. Um, yeah. one, one more question from Houston. This is from Erica. It says, what do you make of the conversation from Philemon's father, Ha, H-A, in a footnote in Liber Segundus. Do you have any comments on that? What do you make of the conversation no. Philmon's father ha in the footnote in Liber Segundus? I'd have to I'd have to study that. That does uh, okay. it's something that's not, a, that's not in the front of my mind. But uh, but it, it does impinge on who is Philemon and where does Philemon come from and what does what does what does the figure of Philemon mean? And I'll try to answer that in the last part of this at, at, in the closing. So maybe without reference to that specific footnote, I would like to consider who is Philemon, what does it mean, and where does it take us today? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, excellent. Let me ask one other email question then. This is from Chicago, or Baltimore. He travels back and forth. Jim Harris, a psychiatrist, editor of the Annals of Psychiatry. He published an article on Jung and Freud that many of us saw recently. Jim's question is, Please ask Murray whether he honestly believes that the Red Book breaks new ground in understanding Jung's model. Jung spent the rest of his life publishing detailed books that he says were inspired by the Red Book. The Red Book does allow the reader to be personally concerned and empathic to Jung's midlife crisis. Is it not the case that it is a better understanding of Jung's struggle, but that it breaks no new ground in regards to psychological studies? Well, that's that's a, a subject of debate in uh, the Jungian world nowadays. Is there anything really new here? Certainly what he says is absolutely correct, that uh, if you know the Red Book, now that we have it, and you see Jung's later writings, you can make many connections. Uh, you can make connections to Ion, those stacked pyramids, uh, those Gnostic uh, pyramids that he uses to uh, give a model of the self. You can make a direct connection to answer to Job. You can make connection to many of his later writings, Mysterium Conjunctionis, and so on and so forth. But does it offer something beyond that, is the question. Does it offer something really new and revolutionary for uh, analytical psychology? And that, I don't have an answer to that. I think we have to study it some more, digest it. Certainly this reference to the transcendent um, is something that Jung hints at in other places, doesn't state very, very, uh, uh, you know, in black and white. Um, and uh, his, um, uh, mm, yeah, I, I have a hard time answering that question. The, uh, for me, I learned a lot from this book that I didn't know about Jung and about his inner experience before, but it is really very much his inner experience at this specific time in his life. And uh, how to abstract from that or draw from that to our discussions of transference and counter-transference or our discussions of, of clinical treatment in various kinds, dream interpretation, active imagination. Uh, what do we put in the center of our practice? Should we do more active imagination because this is so central and this is almost all active imagination? All of that is going to have to uh, 
be uh, how will how will people use this book? How will they use the material in this book? It's so unclear still. It's still too new, and uh, there's so much in it that uh, that uh, it's going to take a long time to really digest it all and and be able to. Maybe in the next ten years we can answer that question. Sonu Ramdasani says that it's going to take ten years to know what difference this book makes in the field, and I, I'm tending to agree with it more and more as I study it and read it. There's so much there, and it is going to take time. But for me, it, it is a powerful question. The, the Red Book so dives into Young Soul. You get a sense of who he is, what Young Soul exactly, and and the way I look at that question is, it's almost impossible to tease apart. Young soul and soul work with his clinical you know, expression. So as you're getting to know Young and his soul, you really are getting to know his work and how he did things. They are so intertwined in, in many ways. He didn't write very much about how he worked with patients, and he's often criticized for that. People say, why didn't he give us more case material, and how did he work with people actually? You get some reports from some of his uh, patients who kept uh, journals and notebooks, and one thing one of them said was he told told her. Uh, Make your own red book. You should make one too. You know, everybody should have their own red book. What what does that mean? Uh, he certainly encouraged people to to have dreams, bring their dreams to analysis, to active imagination. That was very much part of his practice. And so, in a sense, you could say this is a um, a, a model or put yourself into it. He worked on it for 14 years. Uh, 16 years, whatever it was, uh, and he uh, put a huge amount of energy into it because I think he didn't want to forget it. Uh, you have a dream, and after a couple of weeks, it's faded away. If you paint it, if you draw it, if you write it out in calligraphy, you put it in a red book, you go back and read it, relate it to other dreams, you won't forget about it. It stamps it. It makes it, makes it much more uh, memorable. It puts it into your memory in a very powerful way. And that's what you know, meant, I think, when he said, this was the prima materia out of which I, I lived and wrote for the rest of my life. Because he put so much into it, and it, he made it so, uh, so powerful for himself, he never forgot these images and these dreams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's, we've got about 15 minutes left, maybe a little bit more. We'll hold questions for now. Leave me about two minutes at the end, Murray, just uh, to close down, yeah. but maybe again, and wrap up uh, your presentation in the, the time remaining? Well, uh, after the scrutinies, as I said, uh, the Psychological Club was founded and it began going. That was the outer event, so there was a community. But the uh, scrutinies doesn't finish until actually June 1st. So from February 17th until June 1st, there are further dialogues. There are dialogues uh, with Philemon, there are dialogues with the soul, and um, uh, if I would summarize what's going on there, it would be this, that the remainder of the scrutinies after uh, the seven sermons is dedicated to establishing uh, a level ground between the human and the divine, between mankind, humanity, the uh, human being, consciousness, human consciousness, and the divine powers, to establishing a level ground between them. And what the dialogues and discussions are about here, the soul comes and says to Jung that the gods feel that you've neglected them. They want you to pay attention to them. They need your energy. Uh, they need you to come and, and, and work with them and heal them. And Jung says, why is that? Why do they need me? And uh, she says, uh, uh, well, uh, you've, uh, they need the, the attention and the worship and the obedience of the humans. And Jung says, obedience? They want me to be unquestionably and uh, with, without uh, uh, reservation, unreservedly obedient to them? No, I'm not going to do that, he says. He says, uh, I've, humans have served the gods since time immemorial. The gods need to help humans now. So we, if, if they want my help, they have to help me too. And what he's trying to do is establish a basis for a dialogic relationship between the ego self entity, the human, and whatever is beyond it. Okay. Uh, 
first of all, of course, between the ego and the powers of the unconscious. That's clear. That's that's always been the case. That that Jung wanted a, a dialogue going on. That's called the transcendent function. When you have a bridge or a dialogue, a dialogic relation between the ego and the images and the complexes and archetypal forces and so on of the unconscious, uh, uh, that that's standard practice, and we do that in analysis by working on dreams and active imagination all the time. But he wants something more than that. He wants something even beyond that, and he doesn't get around to writing about it until Answer to Job, when he talks about a, um, a mutually transforming uh, relationship between the human and, and the extra-human, the divine, whatever is out there, the mystery. And uh, he wants to put this on an even ground. Now, you could say what has happened to Jung in the Red Book is that his confidence, his ego standing, has increased tremendously from the beginning where he's very small and Elijah and Salome are huge powers and he's afraid of them. Now he's up to talking back to the gods, including Abraxas, any of them, uh, and tells the soul he's not willing to submit in obedience to the gods anymore, to the divine powers, to the mystery. Now there's a famous dream, I think David Treesen's there somewhere too in California watching this. If you are David, this is for you. A famous dream that David has made a lot of and, and he and I have discussed and other people have written about where Jung uh, reports in Memories, Dreams, Reflections that he's with his father and they're in a in a, a, in a Muslim uh, sanctuary in a temple and they're bowing their heads to a, uh, a deity power that's in the wall above and Jung's father's head goes to the ground and Jung's head goes toward the ground he says but it doesn't touch the ground there is maybe a millimeter to spare. Now this stubbornness on Jung's part not to submit uh, in complete and unquestioning obedience to the powers, the authorities, but to stand up and talk to them and discuss with them and try to create a, a, a dialogic relationship in which both sides of the dialogue are going to be equal partners and change is a, a movement toward a kind of theology that you see in modern times in process theology, for instance, where there is this notion that that human consciousness and the, the divine interact with each other and both change as a result and it's all a process. It comes from Whitehead's philosophy and, and what are called process theologians that appeared in the 60s and 70s. Jung's is a, is a very early anticipation of that idea of a process between the human, between human consciousness and whatever else is out there extraterrestrial aliens or the divine mystery to give the human a footing to, to speak from and to stand on. And this building up of a, of a, a strong enough position you see uh, going on in the Red Book over and over again where uh, he builds a tower and the, and the, uh, the, the um, Kabiroi from underneath help him and he, he makes a a castle that is solid and firm and and uh, building a, a state of consciousness that is connected to the self and that can relate to the other in a, a on an equal basis then there is a, a number of there are a number of very interesting passages in which Christ appears twice Christ appears Philemon uh, welcomes Christ he comes as a shade he's just called a shade he enters in and Philemon bows to him and Philemon uh, greets him as, uh, as my Lord and my brother and uh, praises him to the high heavens for all that he's done and given to humanity endless uh, amounts of love and compassion, sacrificing himself, giving and giving. Um, and uh, in, in recognition of that, uh, Philemon uh, says uh, that uh, now you've given enough and the time of your giving is over. Uh, we've, we're entering a new month. This is a reference to the age of Aquarius. We're entering a new month in which everybody, every human being is going to have to do 
their own work. Instead of wanting you to do it for them, looking to you to save them, they're going to have to do the work for themselves. Mankind has to grow up and take responsibility. Mind you, he's saying this during, first, during the First World War, which he sees as a total insanity and people uh, doing things because they're told to do them. Why don't people just stop killing each other? It's madness. Uh, so mankind has to grow up, take responsibility. You can't, the Nuremberg trials said you can't uh, get off just because the authorities told you to do it. Too bad. If you know it's wrong, say it's wrong. Refuse to do it. Be a refusenik. So you die. So you go to prison. Grow up. Uh, and don't expect Christ to save you in the end after you've committed all, all kinds of uh, abominations and sins. Uh, and then you get some kind of cheap grace. Uh, this was Dietrich Bonhoeffer's uh, phrase, cheap grace. This is a diatribe against cheap grace. Uh, so what Jung is advocating is human beings to grow up, take responsibility, and not just put it off on to, conveniently onto somebody else who will forgive them for their sins and, and so they can remain defensive and unconscious for the rest of their lives. And the very final scene of uh, scrutinies, again, uh, Christ comes. Jung says, I went into my garden on a warm summer afternoon, and Philemon appeared under a tree. And then, an, and then the shade came, and again it's Christ. And uh, they welcome Christ, and uh, they greet Christ, and Christ says, whose garden is this? Is this my garden? You know, he walked through the garden alone. Is this the garden of Gethsemane, or is this the garden of the other world? Philemon says, no, this is, this is our garden, this is my garden and his garden. And Christ says, well, I thought I owned all the gardens. And Philemon says, no, that's an eternity. This is this world, this is the world of humans. We own this garden. You're our guest, okay? <laughs> so Christ is the guest now. And they honor him and they recognize him and they thank him. Uh, and the, the very last uh, words of, uh, of the scrutinies, they ask, uh, Christ, and what do you bring us? They said, we welcomed the worm, and he brought us horror and abomination. The worm is the devil, and he brought the war and horrible things that are going on. What do you bring us? And Christ says, I bring you the beauty of suffering. And anyone who welcomes the worm and can, can bear the worm will receive my gift, the beauty of suffering. And that's the end of scrutinies. So Christ is definitely honored, but he's relieved of his duties, okay, in this new age that is now dawning, the new month, as Jung calls it. Everybody has to take up the burden for himself. In answer to Job, he writes about the Christification of many. Everybody has to become a Christ. Everybody has to carry the cross. Everybody has to carry their own burden, take responsibility for their own deeds, suffer their own sins. Uh, and uh, live it to the end. Uh, you can't put it off on somebody else and get by on cheap grace. So that's the message, the final message at the end of the scrutinies, which is a tough book. And um, I guess if we take it to heart, and our field takes it to heart, we can't blame anybody else for our problems. We have to take on the burden of our suffering ourselves. I think the way of analytical psychology is, like Jung's, the way of the solitary. It's never going to be the big mass movement. We're never going to have com conferences of 100,000 members like the APA uh, or other great uh, associations of, in the collective. I think we'll always be a minority, but I think that's a distinction. If we can be a good minority, if we can be a faithful minority, if we can be a minority who really holds up high standards and good quality, then we're doing our work. Um, and we shouldn't blame the insurance companies because they don't pay us our fees, and we shouldn't blame governments because they change our laws, and we just have to take responsibility for ourselves. I think that's one message of this. Uh, on a religious side, I think human beings have to grow up, whether you stay in the Christian church or not. The Pope is starting to grow up. Take responsibility for your group, you know, face it. And uh, on recent reports, he's starting to do that. Uh, these these uh, priests who've been abusing children can't get by with cheap grace anymore. They have to face the music. So that's, that's the message. On a religious side, grow up. If you want to have faith, do it in an adult way and do it with responsibility and not uh, as a kind of childish uh, 
belief system that uh, gives you comfort and lets you off the hook. So I leave you a couple of minutes, Steve. Um, who is Philemon? Let me just say that. Philemon is not a God figure per se. He's a prophet. He's a teacher. And he comes and he goes. At one point he says, uh, he disappears and, and he comes back and Jung says, where did you go? And he said, oh, I stepped out of time for a moment. Uh, he, he, he can, uh, he's in touch with eternity and he's in touch with time. So he's a, he's a mediating figure. And uh, he's not one to worship. Jung doesn't fall down and worship Philemon, uh, but he listens to him and he learns from him. And in the end, I think he integrates Philemon. When he says at the end of his life, I don't believe I know, that's like Philemon talking. Uh, and I think over a long period of time, uh, he says that Philemon taught him the objectivity of the psyche. And what that means is you make a separation between who you are and who the powers are. Uh, you know your limits, you tend your own garden, you take care of your own responsibilities, and you have a dialogue and a discourse with the others, but you don't identify with them. That's psychic objectivity that he learned from Philemon. And uh, it's a, it means you stay humble, you stay in ego consciousness, but you relate to the other powers uh, with knowledge uh, and out of knowledge. And um, over time, you inc that knowledge increases until you can also speak with the voice of, of a Philemon. You can become a teacher, and you did in his time become a very great teacher. And people listened to him as though it were Philemon speaking. Um, I don't have time to go into stories about that, but there are wonderful stories about how Jung's teachings were received in various settings. Okay, Steve. Well, thank you so much, Murray. Really appreciate the second part and uh, the Red Book. And I'm learning so much by engaging with you, and I'm sure others are as well. This has just been fabulous. A couple of things I wanted to cover before we sign off. One, Murray mentioned the Jung White Letters, that a live performance that was uh, recorded and then broadcast on our network last November. It has been delayed a little bit. We were doing basically a bonus section where we we're interviewing some of the actors and actresses and getting their impressions of what it was like to do this this piece. It really is a powerful performance. You know, Victor White was a Catholic priest and theologian who had a powerful relationship with Carl Jung you know, of the day. And to see these men you know, dialoguing and engaging and going through their process of growth, looking at the good and the evil in various pieces is really powerful. It's a 90 minute theater piece followed by a two hour discussion, probably another 30 to 40 minutes of interviews. That DVD is, is at the publisher, it's the proofs are done, and I think we'll be able to release it this week. So I'll send an email to everybody once they're released, but it really is a, a fabulous uh, piece of work done. That was all done by, by Jungian analysts in Zurich. Uh, and Murray Stein helped coordinate that, and the analysts are the actual actors in the theater piece as well. Uh, do check out our, our website, AshevilleYoungCenter.org. We'll have that DVD, plus the blog, plus the, the Twitter, and all the, the social connections we're trying to, to foster. We are looking at a few dates this fall coming up, and I'll have those out in an email fairly soon you know, to people. Uh, Murray Stein will be le leading those two dates, you know, probably with another analyst out of, of Zurich. One of the talks I'm particularly excited about is going to look at global politics. So the projections, the shadow, how does global politics fit in a Jungian world, particularly President Obama, and how his image gets you know, projections all the time, both good and bad, you know, to it. I think that'll be a particularly powerful one, and probably uh, I think September was our, our target you know, for that. So with that, we'll sign off and thank uh, Murray one more time. Thank you very much, Murray. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Murray. Really appreciate it.